I don't know how to say it. Thank you. I understand. Did I ever tell you the story of piss addict the wise? <laughs> Three times now. Three times. I'm sorry, it's just a good story. <laughs> What's the best draw drool? Do we say drool? Cowboy draw. Drool. You got the sort of scared. That's my favorite. Yeah, you got that guy. Well, well. Yeah, when you get the like voice crack break. Yeah, you have to get the crack in. Yeah. Um, you have to get the crack in. We got the. Uh, how you doing over here, little darling? <laughs> <laughs> What's the, the Michael one? Is like. Eat my balls, Dutch. <laughs> His thing is like he holds notes for ages. Yeah. How you doing? It's kind of like. You know, slimy. Cow poke. Black lung. Mm. And then there's John. I've had a whole pack of cigarettes every day for <laughs> 30 years. He's got a unique one. His is special. Yeah. Because, like, to do an impression of it is so, like, extreme, where it's like, that's kind of his talking voice. So mm -hmm. it can have subtleties instead of just, like, hey, I'm over here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you sound out of breath, like, immediately. <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure the last time we did this, you introduced it. I think I did. We were in the hobby that would be, uh, when yeah, we were yeah, uh, on down over here. Every time we do some sort of look back <laughs> over the years. Nah, it's been a while since we've even done it, as they say. Mm. You know? A little bit rusty. You gotta come out of retirement like Clint Eastwood on Unforgiven. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's your best Clint e inst Instwood impressions? Um, I can't do that one. Are you, uh, I'm kind of hungry over here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hungry over here. <laughs> I feel like Dutch is actually the hardest to do. Yeah, because you genuinely need to drink like a bottle of whiskey a day. And you need and to be like six foot four. You need to enormous. be like six foot ten. Yeah. <laughs> and smoke a lot of gas. Uh-huh. I don't think we're going to get... Well, we might get there in this one episode mm -hmm. of... We can't call it the same thing. That's a, that's a good question, actually. That might be a good place to start. Yeah, because uh, last time it was, yeah, it was Red Dead Redemption 2 as good as they say, but obviously that's over five years ago now. Mm. I was thinking, is Red Dead Redemption 2 as good as they say, either parenthesis Redux or parenthesis 2024? Or... Or... Look is, like we're copying Nakey Jakey even more mm. and give it a different title altogether. Like, get some bouncy balls. Well, I do have one in the other room, like yeah. revisiting. No, you can't do that now because it's one. <laughs> what about Is Red Dead Redemption 2 as good as we say? Is Red Dead Redemption 2 just Is Red Is Dead, it? Is Red Dead Redemption 2? Question mark. Uh huh. Mmm. We got options. We do have options. But good afternoon, morning. Evening or night, ladies and gentlemen. Howdy. Howdy, partner. How you doing over there, you fine little thing? <laughs> <laughs> you better get used to it, because I'm going to be doing this the whole way through. And the more coronas I, I get through, the more yeah. the more cigar ash lands on my lap and fills this room. <laughs> the more these bad accents are going to be coming out. And I've been holding this in, bro. I've been You're hyped for this. Bursting. Mm -hmm. Are you bussing? I am... What would be the, like, 1850s version of bussin' be? Um, I'm squirting. Are you squirting over there? <laughs> I'm squirting over here. Well, we are squirting over here <laughs> to get to a redux of Red Dead Redemption 2, as they say. Because what? We did this video around the time of the game coming out. And you know what, bro? I listened to that review again. Mm. Because I wanted to know what we said in that time capsule. Were we on the money? 
I'm gonna say I wasn't, you were more so. Really? Probably. Because and this is yeah, a good place to start the conversation, I guess. Um half a decade later, I feel like this game has kind of sunk quite solidly as broadly one of the best games of all time. Mm -hmm. One of the most beloved games of all time. One of the most successful games of all time. Um just in twenty twenty four alone, um after the GTA trailer came out. I guess on that Rockstar hype, people started funneling back into Red Dead. It's always being played. Content's always being made about it. It's always been talked about theories and story beats and character dissections and whatnot. As I say, Nakey Jakey just uploaded his video recently, like going back to the game and talking about his love for it. Yep. There's something in the air. It won't leave. It, it was. It's got stopping power and staying power. Mm, like a like a Lamat revolver. Mm. It's got that. Yeah, like a navy revolver, even. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so what I was saying in that original review, fresh off, like, finishing it, and... I don't know, I kind of feel like this game, like I do about a lot of movies, where... I don't know if you've fully, really experienced it, or... seen what it has to offer on one playthrough, especially if it's your first. You know? Mm. I'd say it almost takes a full first playthrough to even get your head around, like, what is possible. Like, as far as mechanics, as far as moving around, doing gun tricks, how to not crash your horse, how to yeah, upgrade yeah, pouches, yeah. how to fast travel, how all this kind of stuff. Because um, it's so expansive. And honestly, we've been, like, we've been struggling, kind of like with the Mass Effect videos we did in a similar vein, of, like, how do you even structure a conversation about this game and do it justice? <clears throat> because, I don't know about you, but this, for me, is comfortably my favorite game of all time. One of... Perhaps, to me, one of the most powerful pieces of art or interactive media I have ever consumed. Mm -hmm. um, this this game ch changed everything for me. Um, in a way I completely did not anticipate. I loved Red Dead 1 for what it's worth. I didn't have that like deep emotional connection that opened these floodgates like this game did for me. I didn't really care about westerns before this game. Mm -hmm. Really. I liked mm -hmm. the odd one. I liked when the Coen brothers would do a western. I like, I liked Unforgiven. I liked the odd thing here and there. But it was after Red Dead Two. It really something just clicked. Something about that setting. Something about this character of Arthur. This this tragic story. There's just it's so ripe for storytelling, and what they do is just bros next level. And my in that old review we did, my hang up was like I was really kind of transfixed on the pacing, and that was what the conversation was at the time like lots of people were like first act's way too slow this game's too long the pacing's bad this is slow you move slow when i when i pick yeah, up a hay bale you got to do a full animation every mm -hmm. time it was this kind of stuff um, yeah and I, yeah, I got a little nitpicks here and there about that kind of thing which i'm sure we'll get to at some point but mm -hmm. uh, there's no trepidation in my mind anymore yeah but where this game sits how important it is to me just how much there is to dissect how I think this is my third full playthrough that I just kind of finished a few weeks ago as of recording this. Mm -hmm. um, how many have you done? I've done like two and a half. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. And each time the experience has been quite different. And I've seen things each time that I'd missed previous times or using the honor system, reacting or engaging and just playing in ways that I, I didn't really explore or fully utilized or whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, it is a gift that keeps on giving. Like, Yeah, it's, it's definitely like a desert island game. If... <laughs> <laughs> if... <laughs> got to... I haven't had one of these in a while. And like, I forget, you forget you're not to supposed not to... Yeah, yeah, just kind of instinctually like... Yeah. Mm, let's inhale this! <laughs> yeah, um, if, if it's... If if you were sent to a desert island with like an Xbox and a power supply and like X, Y, mm. and Z, and you could only take one game, it would be kind of a no-brainer. It would be a good choice. Um, yeah, you got you got heaps to do, you got heaps to talk about, and the avenue we're going to focus on, at least to begin with here in this discussion, is uh, the story. Yeah, I think that's going to consume the majority of the conversation. Yeah, and that's so. really what I love about it. I love the character work. I love the plot. I love just so many of the decisions um, they made. Uh, so for context, yeah, this came out, what, 2018? Uh, 
one of the most expensive games ever made, if not the. Um, it's only I'm gonna, sure it was at the time. It's only going to be passed, I think, by the newest GTA. We're talking hundreds of millions of dollars put into this and nearly a decade's worth of dev time. Um, like the actors, I think they worked like seven or eight years on this, like nonstop. Um, there's so, obviously so much yeah. content. There's a... Uh, one of the things about Rockstar is it's quite frustrating actually when like doing research for this and trying to just find out how did how did you do this? <laughs> yeah. Like what what blood ritual did you have to commit to? What what sacrifice did you have to make to get this made? Because like there's a lot of discussion about how like the AAA games industry like sucks. And I'm right there with most people mm -hmm. a lot of the time. I feel like this is that that diamond in the rough where it's like this is what's possible with mm -hmm. that with that level of obscene money and talent and time especially time um left to their devices left to tell the story they want to tell what can be achieved with that yes yeah, it's, it's magnum opus territory for sure for everyone involved if if you worked on this game like you're a genius mm -hmm. you know to be a part of that the end result that is red dead yeah. 2 yeah, the planning, the coordination, the the teams and teams and teams. That, like the the credits at the end when it rolls, it like goes on for like yeah, thirty minutes. Yeah. It's actually obscene. Yeah. Um. Just ha the level of investment and like just yeah, coordination is the word. Just project management, planning, just all of it. So impressive. Let's just set the scene. Let's start this. The year was twenty twenty four. The year of podcasters. <laughs> the, the era of podcasters was coming to an end. Hell yeah. That was one of the things we were talking about in that old video was that at one culture, and I don't know about you, when I started the game, it wasn't quite what I was expecting. That like, I think it's brilliant now, the way it sets that tone with that music. It's, yeah. It sounds dour. You got that like, kind of scary piano, those strings that are like implying like, this ain't spaghetti, western, happy-go-lucky mm. silliness. Like, this is starting at a low point for these characters. They're introduced in the snow. They are on the run, this whole gang. They're reeling from the Blackwater Massacre, they call it. That's how you're introduced to the gang, first off. Yeah. They immediately set up um, Dutch, like, running his mouth. Stay strong. Stay with me. You know, like he he's he's holding everything together. And I, I love the touch of Arthur's watching him like wide eyed, like a like a puppy dog. You know, and and like Dutch is saying stuff and then Arthur's like nodding along. You can see he's he has like faith without a, a better word for it. You, yeah. That character has faith. And with him being your character and listening to what Dutch is saying, it kind of sets you up to be like wait. Yeah, I'm kind of here for this. Like, mm -hmm. That's one of the main... You just touched on one of the main themes of the game, which I think is loyalty. Mm. Um, and it's kind of a, a thing Dutch will continuously reference as a manipulation tactic. Um, if anyone questions his decision, then he'll spin it back round with them and be like, why aren't you trusting me? Why aren't you loyal? Mm -hmm. You question my loyalty? We're brothers. Like, what do you... Yeah, yeah. What do you mean by that? Um, and obviously, yeah... Some people, and I think originally in, in um, from what I could read when doing research and whatnot, there was at one point in, in development, the game opened on the Blackwater Massacre. Really? Um, yeah, in some form. Which I think would have been a mistake. And a lot of people, like, when they're talking about, oh, what are they going to do for Red Dead 3? Oh, why don't, we, why don't we have the Blackwater Massacre in there and let's do that? Nah, leave it. I think that's one of the great things about this game mm. um, is what it chooses not to indulge in, what it chooses not to show. And having this like mysterious event that kicked everything off that you, Arthur wasn't there. Yeah, he's he knows as much as the mm -hmm. player does. So Michael was there, Jose was there, mm. um, and Dutch obviously. So you hear like different versions, different interpretations of what happened yeah. and you never really know the truth as Arthur which is very kind of interesting and you're on my first playthrough I was like are they gonna do like a flashback and like reveal something mm. or 
yeah, what is where to go with this, but I think that's an awesome place to start it and that restraint to just leave it alone. Because it just, yeah, it starts at a low point. There's like immediate stakes. They are on the run. They have a reason to be on the run. It's kind of introducing this Micah character. They're like, with their whispers of something happened with this girl on the boat that mm. went wrong. Mm. Miserably wrong. And now there's this immediate tension in the air with this gang. Hosea was against the idea. Um, Arthur, Arthur was, was against the idea. And now they're in this position where it's like, well, we were right. How yeah. did this happen? And it was Micah's idea. And it was Micah's idea. Now look, we're in this, we're in the snow. We gotta like hunt for food. Mm -hmm. We are like, we've lost multiple members of the gang that you never learn about or see even. I think mm -hmm. you can see their graves there and they mention them by name. These two characters that died in the- Is it two or three? I loved Davey, Jenny, Sean, Mac, they may be okay. We don't know. We're jumping around all these characters and whatnot, but uh, that's part of it. It's like, man, Red Dead 1, um, the, the handful of characters in there is so like focused on John. It's not really about a gang. It all happened in the past from that game's perspective. Yeah. So like, there's this real... I need you to turn this place into a camp. Emphasis on this like camp community aspect and it moving. And that was another thing they were toying with. With development was like the mechanics of this this camp um and like moving it across and there's like game files of like a possible camp that was going to be in the uh, guama in that chapter right can, yeah the like art of it and i read the um that whole section was going to be way longer yeah 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 uh, much like the beginning section um originally the the part in the snow was going to be hours longer yeah because Upon revisiting and replaying that first act, it actually feels extremely brisk and mm. the pace is actually very fast because, like, a lot happens. It introduces the gang, a bunch of characters you don't know. You're introduced to Pearson, you're introduced to Dutch again, mm. Isaiah. Yeah, I think when you know the scope of the game, like, once you've finished it and then go back to the beginning. Yeah. It's 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 like uh, getting older, that... that um portion of your time with the game is tiny compared to mm -hmm. the time you spend doing the rest of it. Yeah. So I love that it starts and ends in the snow. Mm -hmm. Like the first and last mission in the snow. There's something oppressive about that. There's something like, I don't know, it just feels oppressive mm -hmm. um, and desperate. And like in gameplay, it kind of makes your movement even more sluggish. Yeah, yeah. Like, Which I could see... I guess fed into that narrative at the time. So this feels sluggish. This is mm. blah, 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 blah. But quite a lot happens in that first act. Like you got John and the wolves. Establishing how he got his famous scars. His, his... Right off the bat, yeah. Yeah. Um... That's one of the things I love about this game is like, it's probably outside of something like Better Call Saul maybe, one of the best examples of like, avoiding prequel syndrome. Yeah. The like, you, you get fan service, but it's earned. I would say it's earned when you do get it. But for the most part, it's very tasteful. It's very, like, character and story-driven. Um, yeah. As opposed it's to, It's not like, like his Seth when he was younger. <laughs> his, his the snake oil salesman uh -huh. when he was a boy. And they're like, yeah. Like, and they basically, like, look at the camera and... <laughs> yeah. Remember me? Oh, hello there, Seth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Nice to meet you, Seth. Mm -hmm. And it kind of acts as a tutorial segment. You know, Charles mm -hmm. shows you the ropes on hunting. Um, you learn basic mechanics. You do a little shootout with the O'Driscolls who are there. Uh, Sadie's introduced, which is quite a cool mission, quite a memorable introduction. Immediately um, sets the player up to not like Micah. Mm -hmm. The way he's interacting with her. You can tell, like, he's just horrible. <laughs> We're going to get into Micah, but I got some, I don't know, I might have some hot takes on Micah. Okay. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. It manifests in a train heist. There's a train heist in the first act. So, like, introducing Leviticus Cornwall, who's, like, a, a big player, big yeah. industry guy. Yeah. Uh, he's, like, an ongoing through line. And this kind of highlights Dutch's poor decision-making. It kind of all starts here. Why are we doing this? The weather's breaking. We could leave. I, I thought we was lying low. Like, they're saying, why are we hitting the train right now? Like, this is dumb. What are you doing? 
<laughs> what are we doing? There's yeah. something kind of aimless about this, and there's that loyalty is starting to crack a little bit. Yeah, but at the same time, I think the it's it's like a plot wise, it's I think a manipulation from Dutch to be like, let's do something big to like get people back on side. Uh -huh. You know, we're gonna do this big old robbery, and people are like gonna feel good about themselves. Yeah. And it, it goes out, it, it goes off without a hitch, like, mm -hmm. it's a success. And it also makes the player feel like, oh man, this is ramping up already, like, I'm feeling mm -hmm. better about the mood of this game. Yeah, yeah, you get a whole um, set piece, it's exciting, it's fun, you kind of get the the western tropes you want, you get the music, the heart pounding music, the yeah. action, it's exciting, you get the, like, choice at the end, of, like, you're gonna kill these people, you're right. gonna let them go. Really cool intro, I love the intro. I just think, I love when a piece of media begins... And it's so intentional with, like, setting the tone. I think that's so important. Yeah. And it does a really good job with that. Because uh, we were talking earlier about how, like, when you're wandering around Red Dead 1 and there's, like, the spaghetti western music and it's it's kind of more... Pulpy? A little bit more pulpy, yeah. But when you wander around this game, there's something... There's something... There is a dourness. There is something sad, like, baked in. And it's... the Another theme of the game is... The, the the West being tamed being mm. Dutch's whole thing is like he can't let go of the past he has this romanticized idea of the old West and he wants to keep doing things the same way he always has yeah and instead of opening his eyes and changing with the times he refuses to change with the times and is willing to take everyone down with him hmm um, which is part of the tragedy of the whole game. Um, and one of the things I absolutely adore about this game, with Dutch specifically, is how, on that first playthrough, you kind of believe him. Yeah. yeah. You're like this... Even though even though you've probably played Red Dead 1, he's, he's only in that game for like 15 minutes. Um, yeah, his total time in the game is tiny. So, yeah, it almost feels like a cameo. Um, yeah. Compared to, like, he's... So I think he's one of the, the most interesting characters in the whole game, personally. Um, and I think the true antagonist of the game. Um, mm. <clears throat> one of the most complicated, uh, in-depth characters, for sure. Um, and one of the most heartbreaking, because he... The, like, family structure of the gang is, like, Hosea and Dutch are, like, at the top. They started... Um, yeah. They started it. They were, like, a cowboy duo. They founded the gang. Yeah. Um... They adopted Arthur. They adopted basically. Arthur, picked up John a bit later. Mm -hmm. So John and Arthur see Dutch and Hosea kind of as dads, mm -hmm. you know, um, at least authority figures or brothers or people to look up to that the, have always guided them. Um, and there is this communal aspect, this familial thing to the gang that's like partially like a manipulation thing, like it's used as a way to for Dutch to keep the gang together and to keep this idea alive of being free, not being tied down by taxes. We're not paying taxes. We're not. Mm -hmm. We're not playing by your rules. You know, we are outlaws in a time where outlaws really were on the on the down. Yeah, yeah. The world was being civilized. Yeah, it was the West tamed. was being tamed. It was being tamed. So, let's go to Act 2, Horseshoe Overlook. An essential act as far as... Act 1 sets that moody tone, establishes there's that underlying misery and kind of tension. And then you go somewhere a bit sunnier, there's kind of, you know, there's grass, there's... It's a well, less yeah, oppressive atmosphere. When, when you arrive, Dutch is like, this is it. We've done we, it. We, yeah, we, we, like, we found home. This place is so great, I feel it, and... And you're you're there with him, like, yeah, this place is kind of sick. Mm -hmm. And then it, you, the mood is almost a complete. I mean, it is a bit complete 180. The it's in this chapter you get the famous Lenny mm. mission. You ever wonder life is a brutal waste of time? Yeah, that's mm. a quiet time. Um, yeah, you go out drinking. Get such a crucial, like, awesome mission. It's just this whole act to two and three, as far as. Yeah, the gang, there are cracks forming, mm -hmm. 
but we needed as the audience to see the potential and what was good about them together and you really feel that sense of like community and like the bond between them with that Lenny mission with yeah even just like I find the rescuing Reverend Swanson off the train tracks quite memorable because he's like so drunk out of his mind there's something comedic about it and even though there is this dour undertone the the levity that comes from the comedy is perfect mm -hmm. oh it's so good and the the humor was one of the things that really stood out to me in Red Dead 1 when it came out because like truly cleverly written funny games are rare yeah Portal 2 Red Dead 1 um, and I think that's mostly down to just the quality of the writing, the dialogue is, you see it in the credits, like the researchers, they went in to make sure like the dialect is time period accurate. Um, you can see a clear sort of Coen brothers inspiration with the dialogue, with the way they like to, they look like Rockstar and the houses or whatever. They love these like small characters that jump in and out. Mm -hmm. They have, it was more kind of cartoonish in Red Dead 1. Um, yeah, and there are Although, cartoonish characters in here, but Herbert Moon, um, who is just a, a shopkeeper in Armadillo, is in Red Dead Two. Who's very much one of those characters. Mm. He's, he he encapsulates exactly what you talk about. He's like this mega racist, just yeah, dirtbag. But his voice, like whoever voiced him, is mm -hmm. great. Knows exactly like. So this uh, like. A lot of people recommend, like, just make a save here and keep it. Mm. You know, if you want to re return to <laughs> when things are a little bit more chill. Um, yeah. But it's sort of the calm before the storm. Mm. Um, and there are, there are moments where... I feel like there are key moments in the game where things escalate. The stakes, like, raise and raise and raise. Because, like, at this point, you're being told everything. You haven't really seen... You weren't there for the Blackwater Massacre. You didn't play it. You're just on the run. They're talking about the misery. You're not really experiencing it yet. Um, so you've got other missions like... Uh, quite a controversial mission, actually. The Blessed Are the Meek. Uh, which is where Micah's captured in Strawberry. Mm -hmm. And Dutch sends Arthur to go and... Break him out. Break him out, yeah. And it's controversial, I guess, because... And I guess it's a minor nitpick. Um, you've got to like slaughter everyone in Strawberry to get him out. Mm -hmm. uh, which, yeah, I, I, I don't know if... I feel like they justify it within... Um, and it, it's a whole other conversation to talk about the restrictive nature of Rockstar missions in their very free open worlds. Yeah. But the the idea of the mission is you're you're saving Micah and after saving him he's kind of leading the way. He's leading you this really dangerous route so that he can get his guns back. Mm -hmm. Highlighting again how much of a scumbag he is when yeah, he yeah. breaks into a house and you hear him murder like, well, that he a man he's, and his wife. He's in jail like. with someone else. And the other person's like, oh, hell yeah, let, let's get out of here. And he just kills him. Yeah, um, I think he is in O'Driscoll. Yeah, he is. The other guy? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and we didn't touch on... Chapter one, Kieran. Oh, you're you, right. You pick up Kieran. You're right. God, there's so much to keep track of. Yeah. Kieran's um, cool character too. Um, yeah. The whole O'Driscoll thing, I guess. That is set up in Act One, where mm -hmm. they're a rival gang. Um, to, what's Dutch's gang called? Dutch's gang. It's just Dutch's gang. Um, yeah. Um, Dutch has beef, which you get information trickled out. As you go along as to why Dutch so, yeah, has this beef. Dutch killed, what, O'Driscoll's brother. And O'Driscoll yeah. killed Dutch's uh, lover. Yeah. A while ago. So they both have this revenge fueled like, hatred for each other. Mm -hmm. They're beefing. They're, like, plotting against each other. Um, and, yeah, kidnapping Kieran from the O'Driscoll's and having him there captive in the gang um, leads to some quite good moments. Um, yeah, and for me, when I was... I mean, still when I play it now, it's... Uh, he's just a character I consistently feel sorry for. 
Yeah, because they are horrible to him. They're 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 brutal to him. <laughs> yeah, and he he doesn't really even know what's going on. No, he doesn't know who these people are. Like he, I don't think he's ever aware of the beef why it exists he's he's base. he was like a hired gun he yeah yeah i think he just looked after the horses for the address mm -hmm. he wasn't even and he's got like no fighting. agency yeah. as a character mm. which yeah does help with the sympathetic um angle and there's a really good um dialogue with him uh him john and arthur where kieran he's like tied to a tree or something um and he says to John, uh, you know, you ain't all that different from the O'Driscolls. John says, uh, what did you just say? I've been watching you for all these weeks, and uh, you've been tied to a tree. You don't know nothing about this gang. Yeah, well, I'd say, you know, you don't m know much about the O'Driscolls, but maybe I know more about you than you know about them. And I know all about them. Tell us then, how we like those mongrel dogs? You're outlawed like them? You're out to survive like them, you live rough, you live hard, fighting the law, nature, you're out for yourselves. See, that's why you're an O'Driscoll, O'Driscoll, you're out to survive, we're out to live, free. Combs a sneak thief and a killer. Dutch is, Dutch is more like a teacher, kind of reinforcing like that, that loyalty, the belief they have in him. Yeah. When Kieran is right, his observation is absolutely correct. Uh -huh. There is no difference between them. At this point, maybe once upon a time, like, you can read about and overhear conversations where they're talking about how the gang used to be more philanthropic, more yeah. kind of Robin Hoody. Right. Like, they would, yeah. they would actually help people. They wouldn't, mm -hmm. they wouldn't rob and kill just for the sake of it. They had some kind of morals, at least, you know? Something yeah. they stood for, you know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I love that dynamic and kind of teasing that out and that comes back again and again the O'Driscolls are an ongoing rival throughout the game mm -hmm. all the way through it through uh, Arthur's perspective anyway um, yeah do you do you find it this is where like game meets story do you find it a bit absurd the quantity of O'Driscolls in the game yes but I think that's a problem for all of them the like shooting gallery Nature, like by the end of the game, you must have killed like thousands and thousands of people, yeah, which would make you like the most notorious <laughs> serial killer of all time, yeah, you know, or like, yeah, that's one of those what they call it, ludo narrative things, I guess, yeah, which um, they 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 do try and like pass it off in dialogue, and because Dutch says like, Carl Driscoll will just like hire anyone for the gang now. Yeah, and it's like so. A, he must be loaded, <laughs> like have so much money. But B, I, I feel like for a lot of um, those interactions in the open world, they didn't have to be O'Driscolls. No, they could have just been like gang. I guess it makes it easier because they they all wear like a green bit of cloth somewhere on them. So yeah, yeah, you can identify them as like, oh, they're a bad guy. Mm -hmm. And to be fair, there are five or six different gangs in the game you can mm -hmm. find different hideouts you got like the del, yeah. del lobos down in the desert you got the the skinners you got the driscolls yeah um, and they've all got like a different uh style to them or mm -hmm. way they interact um money lending and other sins the mission everyone jokes about like can i just not do this mission because this is the one strauss the uh Oh, right. yeah. The debt collector, who's part of the gang, uh, you know, a loan shark, basically. He loans money out to people who are struggling. Then when the people can't pay, they send Arthur to go and... Rough them up. Rough them up, steal from them, take what they can, uh, get the money off them one way or another. Um, yeah, it's ironically like the one technically legal thing the gang does. Yeah, and there's a, I mean, another one talking about the themes. Like, that's another deep theme of the game is like a critique of capitalism and like what the. Mm -hmm. That's a great time period to do it with the kind of just the rough nature of everything. Yeah, with how you know robbing banks and whatnot is actually like possible in that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Um, and yeah, just the whole overlap of like having train heist missions, having bank robbery missions. It's like, it's just fun, you know? There's a reason GTA 5 was all based around like these heists. These big heists. Yeah. It's, it's fun, it's exciting, gets you involved. Um, but on that Strauss mission, Arthur confronts the Down family, uh, Thomas Downs specifically, and when he's beating him up for his money, gets blood spat on his face. You don't really think anything of it at the time. Mm hmm. Um, but you gotta keep a note of that. The other, the last mission I'll shout out from Act Two is a Fisher of Men, a really good like character moment mission, where Arthur takes John's son Jack fishing, mm -hmm. and it's your first confrontation with the Pinkertons, who were a, a real agency that existed around this time, like they actually existed and. I yeah. think they got in some legal trouble trouble for using it or something. There were some really? like lawsuits to do with the That Pinkertons. wouldn't surprise me because I'm sure the US government doesn't like people knowing what they did. Yeah, yeah. Quite an important mission with some awesome dialogue and establishment, again, of like, you are not welcome here. Also, a uh, fun little touch is that Edgar Ross is there. Mm. The person you kill as Jack... Yes. But stood by the river, and Edgar Ross, without knowing it, is meeting the guy who, when he grows up, will kill yeah. him because of this whole this revenge whole mess. thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, Which is another theme of the game, like the... But uh, that that scene isn't put together in a way to be like, look, it's Jack meeting Edgar Ross. I didn't even yeah, think yeah. about it the first mm -hmm. time I played it. It's not the focus at all. Um, yeah, and Edgar Ross is like kind of a lackey he's like a background henchman you know who, yeah who climbed the ranks as jack grew up um you got some good dialogue like andrew milton says you're a wanted man mr morgan it's five thousand dollars for your head alone five thousand dollars for me I'm gonna turn myself in and there's a, another awesome line in that scene let me just find it you people venerate savagery and you will die Savagely, all of you. Oh, we're all gonna die, Agent. I think that's such a good line. Yeah, he's basically just saying you revere savagery. So you know what? We're gonna take you out the same way you live. Mm. And the kind of impetus of that scene is they're trying to find Dutch. That's who they really want. Yep. He's the ringleader. They figure if they take him down, the whole thing will just dissolve and won't be a problem anymore. Mm -hmm. And they're right. Um, yeah, yeah, it's true. It's correct. Um, but obviously, that loyalty kicks in. Arthur's not gonna give him any information. Mm -hmm. So he basically just plays with them, toys with them. Tells them to fuck off. Um, gives them nothing. Yeah, just to round off Act 2, I think this is the act where you... You, you like, bond with the gang. Yeah. It's, it's the time you're given to start caring about the stakes of everything. And it's when the game actually... The map opens up. Yeah, so yeah, like you can go That anywhere. curiosity is going to get the better of you. Mm -hmm. You're going to start exploring. You're going to start, you know... Going to bars, you're doing these mini games, you're doing, yeah, seeing what you can find, that kind of stuff. That's why it's nice to make a little save there. You can go and explore as Arthur. Uh huh. I, what's up. I don't know how they managed to do it, but for for my first playthrough, it felt so organic with the story and the progress of everything for me to only really explore the local areas of wherever the camp was. Mm -hmm. Like, I treated yeah. it as a camp, and I'd return Yeah, you don't go too far. At that um, point, you don't really understand the, like, uh, food system and the, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Um, and there's the idea of, in the camp, there's, like, a, a box that you can donate to. Yeah. Uh, which is, again, to emphasize this, like, communal thing where like, everyone is supposed to be feeding into this one idea of this, this community that we're building together. Um, yeah, and even within that, there's little touches, like, um, I think it was you who pointed it out to me, but, like, the the first upgrade, you you can, you can have to get them linearly. Mm -hmm. So it's, like, upgrade one, upgrade two, upgrade three. The first upgrade is to Dutch's Specifically tent. Dutch's tent. Um, and there's a lot of subtle stuff with that. Um, he has, he rides an Arabian, the, like, bougiest, nicest horse. Mm -hmm. He has the nicest tent, his costume design. Yeah. He is blinged out. He's got 
he's presenting as if he's rich, as if he's high yeah. society. Yeah. He he has this kind of performative nature to him where he's like listening to opera. He's mm -hmm. yeah, he carries himself as if he's like high society, even though it's kind of the thing he claims to be against. This kind of like pompous. Yeah, but he wants to be it. But yeah, he's projecting that. And it's never, it's so clever because it's never, they don't like stop everything to really put a focus on that. Yeah. But like you're, it's, you're probably subconsciously picking these things up. Um, but he does stand out that like his costume is quite different to everyone else. His, his stature within the group is, is different. Mm. Um, I love that. Yeah. It's a perfect blend of, it's, it's how you utilize the fact that it's a game. Yeah. You know? Mm-hmm. It's, it's just stuff you're picking up on subconsciously. And j just establishing this, like, camp dynamic is one of the things I didn't appreciate the game, I don't think, until this playthrough. The amount of story that they built into that camp is so impressive. I'd recommend, if you're a big fan of this game, to go on YouTube and look up the, like, compilations of, like, just scenes that can happen in camps. Because mm -hmm. there, there are plenty I haven't seen, and I've only seen through, like, watching YouTube videos. And it's like, oh my god, like... I had no idea that Hosea probably had some kind of illness um, that was taking him out. It's like, again, never really put emphasize, never emphasized, but teased at, like when you're moving from Act 1 into Act 2 and you're traveling along, he teaches you how to make something out of like turmeric or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably because he's been doing that because of this illness he has and he's figured out it's a way to dampen that illness. Yeah, and I think it's in Act 2 at the camp when you can hear characters talking about where or how they'd like to die or where they want to be buried or something. There's there's um, a lot of awesome character work in those where, yeah, you can just stumble across just characters interacting. Mm -hmm. Javier might have a conversation with John or say something about John without him being there and might just point at these character dynamics, flesh them out. I love... You would keep an eye out for, like, the way Micah interacts with the gang. Like, when people are, like, sat around the campfire and whatnot, he's always, like, over to the side. Like, he's not really making an effort to integrate, just to solidify the idea. Yeah. He's, he's, he doesn't belong. He's... Yeah, he's also openly racist when that's something that, like, Dutch specifically stands against. So that's an interesting touch. A lot of characters just don't like Micah, and they'll say it to his face. Arthur doesn't like him, and he will say it to his face. Yeah. Two and three are quite similar acts as far as, like, the feel of them. Um, mm -hmm. And as act two comes to a close, the reason you have to move camp is because... Because of the train robbery in act one, you're tracked to Valentine, where you have to shoot up the whole town. Mm -hmm. Thus, like ruining your street cred, you know? <laughs> like Yeah, yeah. And Arthur, <clears throat> he keeps, like, emphasizing, like, we are being too loud. We are making yeah. too much ruckus. Of course they're coming after us. Yeah. And, like, that threat from the Pinkertons, yeah, he goes back to Dutch, and he's like, okay, we gotta move. Hence, going to Clemens Point. Another good place to make a save. It's, like, the best place to do a bunch of fishing stuff. It's, yeah, like, right there on the water. That's my personal That's my favorite. Point. Um, yeah. So this is when it all builds to the, the Braithwaite stuff in Rhodes. Mm. Which on my first playthrough I didn't I didn't really love or really get, but I like I get what it's going for now. Mm. Um as far as like what it's trying to build up and especially like just the way Dutch carries himself and he keeps making up these plans. I got a plan, you gotta trust my plan. Yeah. And just time and time again these plans He's just played. He he put he wedges himself into these conflicts that he thinks like he has some this forty chess he's playing to like yeah. Oh the the Braithwaite's have they got the gold they've got this gold I'm hearing stories of gold, um, which is like used as the justification to get involved in this like mess in Rhodes with these warring families. Mm. Um, so yeah, you have the mission uh, American Distillation, where the. <laughs> Dutch and Arthur are given like temporary deputy status. Yeah. Um, which Arthur again is just like, what are we doing? <laughs> like, it's yeah. so insane. <laughs> um, yeah. You go and steal like the Braithwaite's moonshine. They're like wrapped up in these fairy tales of gold and just wind up getting used by the Greys and the Braithwaite's. Like they're both, they're just stuck in the middle. 
don't see the way they're being manipulated by both sides. Mm -hmm. I'll go and steal the horses from them, go and do this with the moonshine, go give out the moonshine. And like, they're just doing it, being lapdogs, like thinking they're being so smart. Yeah. The, um, the subtly revealed truth behind it all, including like leading up to the, the whole attack on, on Braithwaite Manor, um, is that Dutch's dad died in the Civil War. Yeah. So he's got like an, a bone to pick with the South mm -hmm. and hates these people based on that. And it it could be interpreted that he, this whole thing is just like vengeance for him. Yeah. Like for, for his ego kind of. Yeah. Because when like someone... It, it's, it's in Dutch's like MO. When someone does something to hurt him or disrespect him, he has to. He can't not do it back. And he always interprets it as a betrayal as well. Yeah, it's if like he... a personal attack mm -hmm. on, on him. So he needs to lash out back, but ten times worse. And just burn... Yeah, which burn again, the ground. emphasizes this theme of like pointless revenge. Um, mm -hmm. This cycle of revenge. Arthur has many scenes where he's talking about how it's frivolous, it's pointless, only goes one way. Mm -hmm. um, and he has a completely correct read on that. And I love how... I love how Red Dead 2 tackles the concept of redemption compared to Red Dead 1. Um, it's, it's a lot more simple, I feel like, in Red Dead 1. Like, is the redemption Jack just killing... I, I think re redemption in Red Dead 1 is more cynical. I think um, redemption more refers to John is being forced to redeem himself by capturing or killing the previous gang members. Mm. To is there anything... Re is so, and like then at the end of it, he gets killed anyway. Yeah. So it's like this... It's, it's basically saying, like, redemption doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, you can't do anything to redeem yourself. Yeah. If, if you're seen a certain way, then you are that... Whereas um, it's almost like the complete inverse yeah. with this. There's actually, despite that downness we keep getting at, there is this really hopeful core to Arthur Morgan's arc, mm -hmm. um, which I think is partially how, before this game came out, everyone was saying, John's never going to be yeah, you overtaken. Can't, you can't top John. You can't top John Marston. It's He's impossible. He's perfect. He's incredible. He is a perfect protagonist. And he is. He is. Fair, like he, he absolutely is. But they outdid it. <laughs> yeah. They did. Maybe now is when we should talk about Arthur, because... Bro, I'm in love with Arthur Morgan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he... Uh... He's... He is... He's like the ultimate cowboy, like, masculine character in, like, a real way. You know? Yeah, I think he... He's a perfect lens to look at, like... I, I think cowboy stuff since way back in cinema and stuff has been like this is a man's man this guy's so manly hyper masculine he like never says anything he doesn't emote he yeah doesn't... he's tough as he can handle anything himself like no problem he, he and like he he knows how to he's cold he's rigid he's a lone yeah. wolf he... no emotion yeah like, yeah arthur um especially i i've never delve too much into his journal but what i have oh, read man. is like like he's he's like an artist he he mm. he is um like hiding the real him yeah. he's he's covering it with this hyper masculine like aggressive mm -hmm. he's like sarcastic fun. he's selfish mm -hmm. at the start of the game and you know his true feelings about the stuff he does to downs Mm -hmm. um, like he hates that he has to do that he doesn't want to do it um, it's not the real him but he does it anyway yeah. um, uh, he's, but I remember seeing those scenes and thinking like man Arthur's a badass you know mm -hmm. he's like such a tough guy well, what the, a role model and because then, of the dialogue bro yeah but the, the character's own transformation looking back on the way he behaves like he he starts to use his ability to be like powerful and stern for the right things instead of yeah 
just using it for like the easy route. Yeah. And he, I, he looks back on it and regrets it. I think there's something about the vulnerability they pull out of this character. He's he's got a lot of self loathing. A lot yeah. of a lot of guilt he's carrying around. There's a bunch of opportunities throughout the act to sit down with Mary Beth mm. and talk. Those are cool. Yeah. <laughs> I always ruin um, them though because I do so much hunting. <laughs> yeah. I've just been going around killing animals for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> Why have you been doing that? <laughs> I want to get 100%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So like, I, I, I wrote this down so I could organize my thoughts. Um, there's a line way later in the game that I'll get to. Um, but he says, get the hell out of here and be a goddamn man. This is like towards the end of the story. And I think that part of what connects about him is like, it really addresses like the nature of what it means to be a man, mm -hmm. I think. Um, and what is important about that or like the wrong and right ways to exude masculinity or what that means. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, he's a character that turns from a selfish, violent, rude outlaw to a vulnerable, noble, compassionate, selfless leader who shows John what it means to be a father, take care of your shit and learn from your mistakes, accept your flaws and move forward while trying to do what's right. He's carrying around so much pain, it's so inspiring to see a character attempt to make up for their mistakes and make a real effort to do good with this sudden clarity he gets. And he has this line, um, lack of something to feel important about is the greatest tragedy a man can have. Quite a deep line, and it's like kind of the core of like why this gang starts falling about, because falling apart, because they 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 stop standing for anything. They don't mm. have a core. They're not being proper leaders. They're not caring for each other in a familial way. They're yeah, not. Yeah. They're surviving. Yeah. Like like uh, like Micah. Said. Yeah. Micah's that's, whole. That's his philosophy. Um, I survive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And there's yeah on that that pain with him. Uh, I I kept thinking about this game is what The Last of Us Two tried to be. Mm. <laughs> it, I feel like it. Does I remember it. you saying that what, way back when. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I feel like even more now. Um, I feel like it's addressing some of the same themes. Uh, Arthur's story is actually really similar to Joel's, really. Um, when you break it down, there's some real similarities there, but the way it's yeah. trickled out, I feel like is actually a lot more powerful to me. It feels a lot more like real. So when you find mm. out about his past, it's like through these old flings, through just like these little conversations he has with people where in a vulnerable moment, he shares something. And it's like, oh man, you just don't talk about this. Cause like that's, yeah, cause it hurts. this is hurts. This is, yeah, this is heavy. It's, um, it's all like, bricks in the wall like it's yeah. um why he's built up this mm -hmm. persona yeah um and going back to the the whole thing of like there is something appealing about him when he is being like this macho asshole like when he is whipping out these one-liners like he's got such mm -hmm. a quick wit you know the the line he says to the the child <laughs> <laughs> when he threatens a child <laughs> but like that shit's cold and they used it in the trailers it's like yeah yeah, yeah. it's badass maybe when your mother's finished mourning your father i'll keep her in black on your behalf <laughs> that's such a fucking when he's threatening the child yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what i mean about like that i feel like those clips are the type of shit you'd hear like the Andrew Tate music to <laughs> and uh -huh. they they make like a YouTube short with that it's like you no know, you're you're idolizing the wrong part mm -hmm. because that's the part he's looking back on and hates himself for it yeah. <laughs> he's like embarrassed by it and oh. you know what there is an element of like you know we were saying with Kieran how there is like a lack of agency somewhat mm -hmm. he mentions how his dad was like horrible an awful person Arthur uh, does yeah Arthur does yeah. sorry who uh he mentions like he saw die yeah he says um I wasn't soon he, enough yeah he says he 
He died when I was 15 and it wasn't soon enough. Mm -hmm. I had a son. He passed away. I had a girl who loved me. I threw that away. My mama died when I was a kid. And my daddy. Well, I watched him die. And it weren't soon enough. And he was like a kid yeah. when he was picked up by the gang, so like... He was 15. Um, so he... Anyone in that situation would would have this like affinity for like like Jose and Father Dutch. Figure. They say this. <laughs> yeah, they're brothers. Yeah. They are well, yeah, like right when his awful father figure yeah. dies, mm -hmm. he sees like potentially a really good father or two really good father figures. And yeah, the fact that there was a time where it like it did work and there was something like really yeah, they were all finding something through their pain, um, mm -hmm. a way to go forward. Together. And you, you see snippets of the good time times through snippets. Like it It's like you can you can see that these things would have been more regular, like the fishing mission in Act Three. Yeah. When you go fishing with Hosea and Dutch, it's like, oh the, these are just like three old friends. Mm-hmm. And know, you the, Man, I going back to the camp details. Whenever there's like a, a kind of big deal mission and there's a party, mm -hmm. those scenes are awesome. Yeah, well, it's, like, it's it's like a real party. It's crazy. Yeah. We we didn't touch on um in in Act Two, Sean gets rescued. The first party, Sean is a very fun character, but um yeah, you're right. I didn't know that. Now for some reason. <clears throat> yeah, so you save him. Blackwater. There's a yeah, there's a big old party, and like a real party, if you're like interacting with a group over here let's say by like the the drinks mm -hmm. you're talking to these characters they're having like funny little conversations conversation dips a bit go to a different area of the camp like there's another group mm -hmm. of people having a conversation people start the singing you can join in yeah, on the songs yeah. you can be mean to people you can be nice to people mm -hmm. and the, there's a um a subtle thing you can miss where Sean and Karen sneak into a tent, mm. um, implying they're like lovers, which informs Karen's That's big descent. for kinks. Yeah, yeah. Later on in the mm -hmm. game. Um, just, yeah, just like the level of like expressive character work through that kind of just natural interaction that you can completely miss. Yeah. You don't even have to engage with that, and I probably didn't properly on like, my first playthrough or whatever. I, I don't think it's possible to. No. Nah. Because, like, if you don't know what you're looking for, it's it's all stuff that informs what is going to happen later. So you mm -hmm. don't know what to look for. You don't, yeah. you don't register, like, oh, Karen and Sean are going into a tent, funny little, like... Yeah, yeah. Whatever. It's just a gag. Yeah. But, so, but yeah, then... So much more. Well, yeah, when if you play the game again... It informs that after Sean's death, her alcoholism like yeah, she spirals. Yeah, yeah, spirals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, also, Molly, is it Molly Dutch's mm -hmm. lover? Who you 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 get like a really brief interaction with her in Act Two, at the start of a mission. Where she's like, Arthur, can we talk? And then Dutch just rolls up and he's like, this, Arthur, get over here. I, I think that you. happens multiple times. Yeah, um, yeah. She's really, like, treated poorly by Dutch. And there's some, like, really yeah. realistic arguments between them in the camp that you can just, like, overhear or stumble into. Mm -hmm. And just every time he's, he's not listening to her, not giving her time, being verbally abusive to her. Yeah. Um, and it's... I guess that's actually quite a illuminating thing, like in hindsight, like pointing towards like what the man perhaps really is um, yeah. underneath this. Thing and this how projecting. she ends up where she does, like, yeah, where she's just like, <laughs> she just wants like to be validated. <laughs> yeah, she really isn't asking for much from him, mm -hmm. um, but he is just nasty to her. Um, but there's so much, so much good, like, funny stuff. you got, like, Uncle telling his stupid stories. Yeah. Got Javier on the guitar. People making fun of Bill and him not picking up on because he's such a dumbass. Like, <laughs> I love all that stuff. It's so... There's enough, like, story in that that you could just analyze probably for, like, fucking hours. Um, yeah, it feels so much more real as well than, like, uh, um, Mass Effect 3, the Citadel thing. Mm. Um 
That's a lot more like rigid, isn't it? Um, yeah, it's and very organic. The like camp thing. Yeah, they feel like human beings interacting rather than characters mm -hmm. being caricaturish. Yeah, one of the big missions in Act Three is blessed are the peacemakers, where the O'Driscolls want to meet with Dutch, um, mm -hmm. and they bring it's Micah and Dutch go to meet O'Driscoll himself, while Arthur is up on a cliff with a sniper rifle. Um, he th he says, like, this is... Something's off about this. This is weird. Like, why yeah, here? Sussy. Why now? Dutch, this is sussy. But, yeah. Dutch ain't listening. He does what he wants to do. Arthur winds up getting captured by mm -hmm. the O'Driscolls in, like, a pretty crazy scene where um, yeah, he's, like, hung upside down and he's got yeah. to escape this camp. Um, I guess there's one little nitpick I have there. With uh, like the the way he escapes is kind of like he leans over and a candle. There's a candle there, and like there's a shotgun shell, I guess, which he I guess conveniently opens and he like seals his wound with um with like a candle and the he takes the like explosive out and puts it on his wound and right. seals it or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes for like just the mechanics to work, like just something has to happen then and there, like. Yeah. Let's get the mission moving. Let's let's go. I, f I feel like the setup. Um, it's it's my main nitpick with the story in this game in general, is like the the composition of a bunch of scenes. Like getting there. Like, like the how characters appear in scenes. Um. Mm -hmm. There's there's an example like way later, but like sometimes it just kind of looks awkward, which mm -hmm. to me is like this is a video game, so surely you could just like Yeah, it kind edit of feels like out. the conclusion is the starting point and they yeah. gotta get to that conclusion. Yeah, and um, they're 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 working with like preset so I, I don't I it is way beyond my understanding how you build an open world game and then oh, so complicated. and then make cutscenes to fit mm -hmm. in this world. They're all in engine. They're all <laughs> yeah, and like you've you've got to build this world around being playable, but also have these cutscenes that ninety nine percent of the time look amazing. Um, so I yeah, I don't know if it comes from that and like the heavy use on mocap, so they're kind of limited by yeah physical space. In like a warehouse, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's that's just something you don't really notice it as much on a first playthrough. But is it, is it going back, you definitely yeah, pick up on it more. Yeah, and there's there's some conveniences in cutscenes mm -hmm. that are strange, and you, it's you don't really get it in like God of War or mm. The Last of Us. But I would assume that's because they're both like. Linear, they're like, hyper linear in comparison. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. The, I mean, The Last of Us just is so that they can build the cutscenes, which often happen in spaces that aren't like gameplay arenas and mm -hmm. blah blah blah. So that could be an explanation for it, but yeah, it's just something that makes me feel a bit funny. Mm -hmm. your, your brain kind of picks up on it, and there's yeah. I think there's heaps you can criticize about like mission design and um yeah, yeah. this kind of thing and this uh these waves of enemies or whatnot, but um yeah, we've already kinda of mentioned that. Um I would say towards the end of Act Three is when shit starts kinda of getting real. Shit starts hitting the fan in a way that's like Oh, this isn't like any fun in games. Yeah. This is this is really bad. Um, mm. It kind of starts for me. I remember this being a big deal on my first playthrough. Like, a, oh shit, they. Okay, nobody is safe. Um, a short walk in a pretty town where they're ambushed in roads mm -hmm. and Sean gets obliterated. Um, yeah. Then and there in the streets. And yeah, it's shocking on that first playthrough and indicates, like, a, yep, nobody's safe. We can just take out anyone at any moment. Yeah. Um, you are creating enemies with the way you're conducting yourself mm -hmm. and you are not welcome and the mess just kind of crescendos through this act until you get that crucial mission blood feuds ancient and modern the kappa for the act the braithwaite manor 
attack, which uh, partially I think is so important because it's, I think the last time you see the gang working fully in unison together for a goal they're mm-hmm. all kind of invested in. Um, everyone, all the character motivations are different, which is clever. Um, Dutch's motivation for wanting to do that is a lot more selfish. He doesn't, I don't think he really cares that much about Jack. Yeah, I don't think it's about Jack. I think it's more Jack is mine. Um, mm-hmm. You're and disrespecting me and you're been, from the South. So you're, you're from the South. You've been playing us with this moonshine stuff, with this mm-hmm. stealing the horses business and all this. Yeah, all this you, stuff you that's disrespected me. Yeah, yeah. Is, is what it's he just wants revenge yeah. for being played, basically. Yeah. Um, and that's a great avenue to do it. Mm. So you got that, whereas like John and Arthur, they just want to get the kid. Um, yeah. And someone like and Jose, yeah, 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 especially Jose too. And that mission, bro, that was <sighs> the, the the first time I played the game. I was the Sean mission set the stakes for like where this could go. Then the Braithwaite Manor mission is like I I think the the build up and the way the cameras framed and the music and everything. I mm-hmm. think it's on par with like Good, Bad, and Ugly type stuff where it's like this is fucking awesome <laughs> this is so cool yeah holy shit man there they are who steals a goddamn boy i'm gonna let fly at those sons of bitches john i need you to stay calm like i'll regularly just watch that mission on youtube <clears throat> or just replay it um it's Get down! It's a moment. You inbred trash! And it's... It's brutal. You know? Like... Yeah, it starts off feeling really heroic and awesome. And, like, yeah. you're, you're this righteous gang. Mm-hmm. And then and then you burst into the house and you're gunning down people. And it's, like, all this, um, like, beautiful architecture mm-hmm. and interior design. Like you're just everything wrecking. they're not. Yeah. Yeah, and then you're making your way out of the house after you've, like, gone up the spiral staircase. It gradually gets more brutal, like, the... More intense, yeah. And, yeah, that you're in, like, a tighter environment. You've probably switched to a shotgun, so you're, like, exploding heads and blasting Mm -hmm. arms off. And then you follow Dutch down the stairs of this old woman's house while he's dragging her by the hair, I think, down yeah, the stairs. Is. She's, like, screaming and, like, mm-hmm. grabbing onto the railing and, like, and yeah. then he, like, pull, yanks her off. You're watching the whole thing, you're there. Yeah, and, and Dutch is like, fucking burn the place down. I get... Fuck this. And Specifically through that, for that section where Dutch is pulling her down the stairs, I get, like, tingles down my spine because it's so, like, so horrifying. It's so... Yeah. It's a weird conflict. It's like, you don't know what she's done with Jack at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're kind of like, I see where Dutch is coming from. Mm-hmm. As a kid, their their whole thing is like, you don't mess with the kids. Like, Yeah, which is fair enough. Like, mm-hmm. to, to steal someone's kid, like, that's, that's messed yeah. up. But yeah, the, the brutality of that, like, you, you can't ignore it. And then... She's like, you just killed all of my kids. Mm-hmm. It's my like, whole family. This, I, we've yeah. been here for generations. Yeah, um, and the house she lived in like, is being burned mm-hmm. down, which, like, probably fair enough. Probably like some slave trade. <laughs> yeah. <and shit>. Um, <laughs> but then oh, she's just left wailing while this crazy. house burns in front of her. It's. it's Does she go back in? I think you're right. Yeah. Like, there's nothing left for her. She just goes and she burns it. With yeah, it, with, yeah. With that. The strings that are playing with that like oppressive atmosphere, it's like a really horrifying moment. It's really powerful. Yeah. And like quite emotionally <coughs> confusing. Cause it goes from like, yeah, cool man, we're the gang. Yeah, we're the gang we're rolling the up on over the here. big rich assholes. <laughs> yeah. And decadent house. And it is, yeah. yeah. I, I just I think it's so cool that they managed to get in a moment where it's like, yeah, we're working together, we got mm. the whole gang lined up. Mwah. So fucking good. I just love that mission. But it doesn't work out for them, obviously, because they're just spreading more carnage, making more names uh-huh. for themselves. Um, and again, the Pinkertons show up. 
Um, they right. say they f they find the camp, mm -hmm. and they're like, "Hey, we'll leave you you alone if we can just have the urge. Um, or we'll come back and kill all of you." So Dutch now, or we'll kill you all. And when I return, I'll be with 50 men. All of you will die. Run away from this place, you fools. Run. So they leave. <laughs> yeah. Um, they, it's just this continuous thing of them not really taking the threat seriously enough. Or like, not doubting Dutch enough. Yeah. You know, it's like, they do only want him. <laughs> yeah, like if he really did... He says at the beginning of the game, like, if I could throw myself down in their place, I would. Mm -hmm. totally and that's when says. Arthur nods, he's like, yeah, yeah. I believe you. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, well, you're you're literally being given that opportunity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. So, you know. Mm -hmm. He's endangering all of them with the way he's conducting himself. Yeah. 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 Um, but the, the next mission is the one you were just mistaking. Um, where you move into the house. Where is that where Micah like thinks he's found a place, but it's actually somewhere that sucks? And so what? No, that's what um, that's that the beginning before, of three. That's yeah, yeah, as you're looking for three, um, and you yeah. find the Germans. So yeah, you go into this house which was owned by like some like separatists or something, mm. <laughs> like some dudes who who don't want to be in the New America. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you stumble into one of the bedrooms, and a guy just blasts himself in the head. Act four. Shady Bell, the bayou, the scary zone. Yeah, legitimately the scary zone. To touch on, like, the atmosphere of this place, quickly, before we continue with story, terrifying. Mm-hmm. Like, especially in that first playthrough, when you're exploring, you make that camp, and then you're attacked. Yeah. And they just threaten you and walk off. And yeah, I, I think, um, the, the night folk, they're called, they don't, mm. they don't speak. Oh, they're horrifying. They, they just, like, kind of jog towards you silently, just like the pitter-patter of their feet in mud. Um, my first experience with them, if I remember correctly, was, like, the, a bunch of hanging bodies. Yeah, that you if you notice. interact with them or cut them down. Yeah, so I, I naturally, like, shot the rope, mm -hmm. body fell, and then you just hear these pitter-patters and little, like, red dots on your mini-map, and mm -hmm. you're like... Well, What's happening? And the fact they're not saying anything. Yeah, that makes it. Yeah, and you scary. you shoot them and they don't like go ow. Mm. <laughs> I, I mean, like that that would be a weird reaction to being <laughs> shot, but but they, they they don't do anything. They just like get hit, get back up, and then keep yeah. going. It's freaky, man. Cool freaky faction, and there's like a cool side quest in that area with like the poisoned water, and or is that slightly north? Might be getting the map confused. Um... But yeah, this is kind of the introduction of uh, Saint Denis. Mm. Quite a, quite an important location as far as like bringing out this element of industry and progress that represents everything the gang is against. Yeah, and far more effective than Red Dead One in that regard. Like, yeah, Blackwater was the the like city of the game that was meant to be like this is the place of law and order mm. and it was like 10 buildings in a row <laughs> <laughs> right yeah yeah it's, it's like a small town really um there's some big issues. i think it's uh i think it's beautiful as far as like the architecture and the trams and stuff mm. and i can't take credit for this observation but i heard in a different review the 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 way the map feels like so claustrophobic um to the characters and to like to navigate through reinforces that idea of like they, they don't like it there they don't like being there they mm -hmm. don't want to spend time there it does represent everything they're against and like the design of the map reinforcing that is really cool to me yeah it's it's based off of a real city which i'm blanking on isn't it like florida no the orleans? place where the 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 lady and the the princess and the frog new orleans new orleans yeah okay yeah new orleans um yeah, because all of the it's it's not real states, but they are based on yeah. real states. Yeah. You know? So yeah, this is the whole Saint Denis Angelo Bronte stuff. Because mm -hmm. from the Braithwaite's, they find out they gave Jack to Angelo Bronte. Hence, where they got to go. Yeah, I wrote down here. It's a smoky, claustrophobic symbol of everything they stand against. 
rapid industrialization, cramped streets, a tamed city with high law presence as well. That's another mm. key aspect to it. There's a lot of law. The stuff they play with in this chapter, this is when a nun gets introduced. I shall pray for you. Oh, I'm not a religious man, sister. <laughs> in little like side quests, and, like, you, you have to do. <laughs> you get the, the, maybe the best cutscene in the game through the nun, um, mm -hmm. which is entirely missable. And I missed it on my first playthrough. So make sure you do that stuff. So yeah, you get Jack back from Angelo Bronte, who no longer cares about Jack, as he was planning to sell him back to the Braithwaites anyway. Um, but they're all dead, so he doesn't care. And he really doesn't have much investment anymore in that whole dynamic. Um, yeah, Angelo Bronte is like a... It's like an opportunist. Yeah, he's a big wig uh, crime boss. Yeah, and kind of just what like happened in Rhodes, he figures out... Hey, maybe I can get, maybe I can manipulate these guys. Um, mm. Maybe I can get some stuff from them. Um, you get the Gilded Cage mission, where there's a party with the mayor, and you get tipped off about a card tournament being held on a boat, which is quite a fun mission. I'm glad I played that like just before going to Vegas, because there's the whole thing <laughs> where well, there's there's a character in the background who is feeding you like the what cards to play. I think it's Strauss. No, you're right. It is Strauss. It is Strauss. Yeah, because he blends in quite well. Hosea yeah. is there, but he's undercover as one of the cops. As a I guard, think. yeah, yeah, yeah. Which there's there's some um, a little bit of racial mm -hmm. like profiling yeah. going on. Yeah, yeah. I, there. That. Um, I like how the game it doesn't shy away from this stuff. It just presents it as like this is just normal for this time. Like yeah. playing it now and seeing it, it's like Jesus. Mm -hmm. People were just assholes, you know. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, yeah. but in the context of the game, it's like all all the characters like react to it as if it's just a daily part of yeah. life, which I sadly it was. And I think they are trying to make allusions to like within these new societies and cities that are being built, there is still like corruption and evil, which is like Dutch's motivation to be mm -hmm. against it when he's he has a line like. <laughs> Later, where it's like, the way I see it, you, you steal, I steal, you kill, I kill. Mm -hmm. it's just making out, like, yeah, this f philosophy that he's living by. There is some truth to it, as far as, like, the observations he's seeing and the conclusions he's taking from these places. You kill, I kill. You rob, I rob. Only difference I can see is I choose whom I kill and rob and you destroy everything in your path. American Fathers is another mission I noted down from this act, which is the introduction of the eagle flies in the Wapiti reservation. Another aspect of the game I, I now and again see complaints about where it's like, well, why, is, why do we keep doing with this? And was, I think it's so important to establish that and have that be a key part of the story, especially for Arthur's humanity and uh, what it brings out of Dutch too later on. But what you do in the American Fathers mission is uh, steal reports on the oil reserves at the reservation. Because um, kind of like uh, Scorsese's latest movie, the Native Americans are getting fucked over mm. for the oil that's rightfully theirs. And yeah, you go and steal those reports. Another escalation moment and kind of unexpected horror, I suppose. Uh, Horseman Apocalypses is the name of the mission. Poor boy Kieran. Decapitated yeah. his head, put on a horse. There's that. It's like a out of tune piano note or something that plays as he's like coming down, and it's like spine chilling. Yeah, and at this point, it's it's like you sort of feel like everything's out to get you, mm -hmm. even though it's it's kind of everything Dutch is doing. You know the the police, the Pinkertons want the gang. Primarily for Dutch, the whole Braithwaite situation was all <laughs> exaggerated by Dutch. Mm. That was all blown out of proportion, totally avoidable. And the O'Driscoll situation, all these separate happenings are Dutch's fault, essentially. Yeah. But again, like first time through the game. It, you more read it as, we're the goodies, they're the baddies. We're, good, we're just trying to get Jack. Yeah, That's we're, why we're here. We're being the good guys. Mm -hmm. Like, what, what'd you say fuck me for? 
even though it's like immediately Bronte's like, hey, can you go to a graveyard and like <laughs> deal with these uh, graveyard robbers and like this random stuff? Yeah. <laughs> and they just do it. So the, the mission Urban Pleasures comes up where they're tipped off by Angelo Bronte about a trolley station holding a large sum of cash leads into someone I only learned about maybe in the last eight months or something, the last year. The, du the Dutch trolley theory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Dutch! There's this whole disaster that plays out where the tip was false, they were played. Um, shocker. <laughs> shocker. I think Arthur even makes a gag where he's like, is this trolley going to Tahiti? <laughs> or something yeah. like that. Is this trolley going to Tahiti? And yeah, it kind of winds up with them hijacking this trolley and it crashes. And Dutch gets a pretty significant bump on the head and it's, it's shown clearly in a way where well, there's some intent to it, it feels like, anyway. I don't know. In that, yeah. In that mission, it, it does. Mm hmm Because I, I didn't look out for it until my second playthrough. It doesn't um, seem like an accident, but it also seems like stuff really escalates after that mission. As far as his downfall. Yeah. He, he like, it feels like the straw that broke the camel's back to me, where like that outward image he is projecting is like hanging on by a thread and then this head injury that he gets to is just like, he can't hide it in any form anymore. Yeah, I think the result would have been the same no matter what, whether yeah. he got hit on the head or mm -hmm. not. But... I agree. Some people put too much weight, I feel like, on that whole yeah. conspiracy. Where it's like, he would yeah. have been a good guy otherwise. Where it's like, no, nah, there's a lot of clues before then, a lot of like, yeah, a lot of stuff yeah, going he'd, on. He'd him. already done a lot of wrong. Yeah. Like, I mean, the, the inciting incident that we don't see, the Blackwater Massacre, like, yeah. we learned that he killed an innocent woman for no reason. It's like a young woman yeah. yeah the the one that um the the guy that's theorized to be like the devil the mysterious oh, man yeah, I love from red stuff. dead one yeah yeah um who is referenced in red dead 2 mm -hmm. in armadillo's shop you can find that um, painting yeah and you can ask the shopkeeper herbert moon you can ask him yeah. about the painting do you know about the mirror <clears throat> the mirror where you can go in that room yeah 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 and you can just see him in the reflection yeah and he's only in the yeah creepy as hell yeah, I love that kind of stuff, dude. Yeah, yeah, and but Rockstar's special for that stuff. Mm -hmm. It's like you've made the most fleshed-out story that <laughs> we're basically spending this whole video talking about, and you've got all this other stuff, and like the time traveling guy, and like yeah, like, all this stuff. I like, yeah, just the little hints of like science fiction or like fantasy or yeah, I love yeah, that, the that giant in the yeah, the giant, uh, the Sasquatch guy. The I love that time traveler side quest yeah where he's just a he's he's from the 50s or something yeah he talks like a fallout character that's you know? right he's, yeah, he's got yeah. that cave and arthur's like i don't know what you're saying i can't understand what <laughs> yeah. you're talking about yeah <laughs> it's like it's it's not important to the story it's totally a side thing uh-huh and it wraps up in its own little pocket but it's like yeah where you meet the same character or you meet his mother holding him as a baby mm -hmm. it's like <laughs> 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 It's funny, it's weird, there's something kind of, like, scary about it. Like, it, it just opens these possibilities and makes this this frontier just feel, like, mysterious. And, like, yeah. what is going on here? <laughs> yeah, and then there's the more grounded, spooky stuff, like the, the pig farmers. Ooh. I, I love that, um, that clip of Arthur's reaction to their behavior after finding out their siblings. When he, he's like eating dinner and he stops and he, his eyes just kind of dart between them and he's like, <laughs> the the cogs start turning and he's like, oh, uh oh, yeah, yeah, but yeah, Dutch bangs his head. It even could be that, like, he's just annoyed by it. Well, that's it? that's definitely a part of it. Cause we were just saying about like his motivations for that Braithwaite thing where. There's more going on than just trying to get Jack back. There's this... Mm -hmm. He sees everything as a personal attack, and after the trolley incident, obviously the tip came from Bronte, he's not just going to let that go. Um, yeah. In the mission Country Pursuits, which includes that... Another kind of scary, horrifying moment, the giant alligator. <laughs> yeah. Um, Shit, yeah. Which you can go hunt later, which is mm -hmm. scary to hunt, even. It's mm -hmm. so big. Like, when it's running around, it's like, it's running at you. And it's like, oh my god, is it, it yeah, looks it's, like a mod or something. It's it, so yeah, enormous. Yeah. Um, 
It's the size of a tree. Yeah, I remember getting like a burst of adrenaline the first time I played that. Like, <laughs> nah, 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 I can't be doing with that. But basically, Dutch convinces everyone that Bronte needs to die. And the reason they go to that alligator place is that he, he finds a guy in the bayou who's going to let him borrow his skiff so they can attack from the water. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So it's easier to get to the manor where Bronte resides and they can attack from the river, yeah. Which then leads to the revenge is a dish best eaten, which kind of like the Braithwaite manor thing. Not as good as that as far as a mission's concerned. Um, but... Again, uh, it, it, it more leans on the dourness. Um, it's dark. It's real dark. Um, and it's more about like characterizing Dutch to me. Where it's just that like each one of these is like a more extreme, it's like ramping up with him. Each one of these engagements he's having, he's like being more and more monstrous. Mm -hmm. And like going back to the, these morals or like this philosophy. It's like, what, well, yeah, what are you actually like doing this for? Like, this seems so self centered and like only serving yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and it is just a brutal revenge and drowning. He like drowns this character, yeah, in front of everybody, and everyone's kind of like, "Dude, um, <laughs> it's, it's when John has one of the best lines, and like straight out of Red Dead One, mm. where he's like, Dutch, where in your philosophy books does it say about <laughs> drowning and feeding a man to, to alligators? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Jesus, what in your philosophy books cover feeding a fellow? The goddamn alligator, Dutch. The part that covers." Weakness. That part. Just being and, realist. And then Dutch is like the part that covers revenge. <laughs> mm -hmm. Where it's like this facade is like fading. Um, yeah. I feel like that's a moment for for John, especially. Mm -hmm. Where he's like, this this is just unhinged. Like we're all we're all kind of bad guys. We do scummy stuff, but like drowning a dude and then Feeding him feeding to alligators. Him to alligators. It's, like, it's dark. Because he made you bang your head. <laughs> yeah. And I feel like I've said it a few times. It's like, this is the bit where it hits the fan. It's yeah. like, this truly is the moment where I'd say the gang is over. Um, is the end of this act. Banking the old American art. Where some reason they decide to hit the bank. In something mm -hmm. new. It's so it, stupid of them to do that. I think it's um, a Dutch sunken cost fallacy. Yeah. It's like we've we we hit the trolley and we, we got played again. We didn't we we made no money. We probably lost money doing mm -hmm. it. Um so we got to make this a worthwhile venture. And uh, painful mission, man. Mm. It's not right. Shout out the costume design choices in that. Uh, everyone is in dark colours, aside from Micah, who's in full white, which is an inverse of the trope of normally white is worn by the good or pure characters. Yeah, um, if you look at the good, the bad, and the ugly. Yeah. Important characters are taken out here. This, The loss of Hosea is the mm -hmm. big one they have for the Pinkertons execute him in the streets, um, which I think for me is actually more of a turning point for Dutch than the trolley incident. Um, I think yeah. he's say a, he's like the angel on his shoulder. He's like a voice of reason, a voice of logic. He's consistent throughout all of this. Mm -hmm. He's what he's saying is good advice. Like every time he's saying, like, I don't think we should do this. This is a bad idea. This hunt for gold is stupid. But no one's listened to him. Yeah. Um, and, and him all, going. All the missions you do with Hosea um, are like really low stakes. Low stakes, low reward. They're quaint, like, charming. They're more about yeah. like let's you know, let's using your wit. Bear. Let's let's uh, distract some some mm. silly dudes while we steal their stuff. Yeah, it's like let's put on a character and like yeah, yeah, yeah. He's he's got all the fun cowboy stuff going on. Um, mm -hmm. You don't just lose Jose on that mission. You also lose Lenny. Um, something symbolic about losing the oldest and youngest. Mm -hmm. members of the gang which i feel like is another emphasis on this is over the past has died and the future yeah um and lenny's death especially is like just horrendous because i i feel like most people who play the game will will have a particular fondness for lenny because of the Lenny mission yeah, yeah, yeah and like you're gonna know his name because there's the lenny, lenny! button 
<laughs> Linear. And, you, and like, it, when you're drunk and it's switching the letters around and... Yeah, yeah, and like there's million Lennies. <laughs> yeah, everyone turns into Lenny. Like, yeah, you're yeah. gonna know and love that character. Know, yeah, yeah. And like, you're dancing with him in, in the bar and the way he goes down is like, a door opens and he gets blasted. Mm -hmm. And it's like and too quick. Like, it's not even in a cutscene. No. Nah. And, and you, most people don't stop to even like, acknowledge him dying, like in the gang. Yeah. Um, Arthur does. Mm-hmm. Um, I think John does too. No one else does, I don't think. It's so hectic, it's so like... Yeah, yeah, you're on like a rooftop. So they rush off after the heist and manage to, thanks to Charles, um, get onto a boat. Which winds up capsiding and they're washed up on Guama. Yeah. Uh, which is... I don't, no one expected that, I don't think. No, hell no. I definitely didn't. Um, and it was one of the more controversial acts, I feel like. I can see that. I can see both sides, where I think it's really good for what it does to Dutch's character specifically. And I think it's important to have a bit of time, so away from the main location, so when you return to it, the dynamics can be quite different. And it feels like things have progressed and the tension's higher. It, it gives uh, Sadie a moment as well, to because she, she, up, she yeah. becomes the leader of the people left back um, in America. Yeah. With so Dutch's absence. She, she, well, most of the absence. Most of them are gone. Yeah. Um, and she kind of becomes proof that like they don't need Dutch. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's another good point. I don't know if it needed to be as long as it is. Yeah, I, I'm not really invested in the whole, like, there's, there's some kind of, like, revolution happening on the yeah, island. Yeah, it is, like, historically based on yeah. goings-on in, um, is it a fictional Cuba? Yeah, it it's quite like a big map, place? and you you can't really go to any of it. Um, it's quite restrictive, gameplay-wise. Yeah, the game totally changes for that one chapter. And yeah. And you'll... it is fairly short. I think I finished it in like two hours or something. It's not very long. Yeah, two hours in the context of Red Dead is nothing. Yeah. <laughs> That's like 10 minutes in yeah, right. another. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's not my. I don't think it's the best act. It would probably be my least favorite act if I had to choose a least favorite. Mm. But I wouldn't cull it either. No. Because it is so unexpected. It is such like a jolt. And there was something fun about seeing this smaller group of characters from the gang just like forced into this bizarre new situation. Um, mm -hmm. And watching them trying to figure out how to get out of that. I'm assuming part of its purpose is to show Dutch's eagerness to like jump on other people's yeah. struggles and try and mm -hmm. take credit. Take credit or like use them for his own gain in some way. Yeah. Because he, like, makes yeah, a deal he, for, like, a boat or whatever. Yeah, I think Dutch doesn't... He's someone who wouldn't care what the... The... Like, hierarchy is. He just wants to punch up. Mm -hmm. You know, he... He, he needs to, yeah. to rebel. Yeah, he wants to be... He wants to meet up with powerful people and act as if he's, like, on the same level as them. Um, yeah, and bring them down. Yeah. And on the character stuff with him, there is a big moment where he murders an old lady in cold blood, promises her gold. Um, yeah. She's leading them through this tunnel. He just kills her. He, like, strangles her or something. Yeah, she draws a knife on him, but she's, like, a five-foot, 80-year-old mm -hmm. woman. I was like, really, man? You've had to... really had to do that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just, yeah, this constant, like, doubt. Yeah. I feel like that's a real moment for Arthur to be like, man, I think we've gone too far. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we might have gone too far in a few places. And that's where Dutch lies and then contradicts his own lie. Mm -hmm. Like... Within, like, ten minutes, yeah. Less than that. Within, within five minutes. Yeah, yeah. And maybe that's head injury thing? Mm-hmm. That maybe that, like filter where he wouldn't strangle an old lady is like being blocked well more, more the lying and then forgetting that he lied mm -hmm. 
so quickly. Um, I think just part of that is like, he is panicked. He probably knows that it's, he is in a mess and like, he can see what John, he's hearing what John is saying. He's hearing what Arthur's saying. He's hearing this doubt and he keeps saying it like the, where's your faith? Where's the, mm. where's the loyalty? Mm. When are you going to betray me then? Um, he says that straight up to Arthur at one point. Like you seem like the type. Like he says that to him. Like that's messed up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but what I do like about act five is actually when you get back from Guama, um, and the stakes are raised yet again. Yeah. When you go back to the old camp, get the like coded message from Sadie, go and find the, the, the new hideout, um, mm -hmm. where the Pinkertons immediately attack. And that Which whole mess happens. Which is the point when Micah, Micah got picked up mm -hmm. by the Pinkertons. That's, when, they came that's back. when he started snitching. Yeah, like so. canonically that's when it began. Yeah, so that could explain the, the convenience of them not attacking until they arrived back at that moment. Perhaps that's also another reason for the whole Guam uh, section is for that rat setup. It kind of yeah. makes that kind of makes sense. Yeah. Then you really get the the awakening moment for Arthur in the a fork in the road mission, where you're you're just going somewhere and something starts happening to him, health wise. He falls off his horse. The music is intense, oppressive. You're dragged into a doctor's surgery and get diagnosed with TB. You got tuberculosis. Really sorry for you, son. It's a hell of a thing. And I don't know about you, but when when that happened on my first playthrough, I, I googled when was TB, like, mm -hmm. when was the vac vaccine invented, whatever. And it was a long time after that yeah. time period, so I was like, oh, no. And even then, I was still like coping, like maybe, yeah, he was, maybe he's something. He's gonna like, use that gin son. He's gonna, yeah. I'm gonna keep making these. He's just gonna uh, make tonics. Tonic. <laughs> he'll he'll keep it alive. He'll I'll keep fix it going. Him. I'll fix it. But this, like the not showing Blackwater thing, I think is one of the best decisions in the game, because it immediately dissolves that whole question when on that first playthrough of like, he's not in the first game, his fate is unknown. Mm -hmm. that takes the mystery out immediately and then it becomes more about like what does this mean for this character with the time he has left and how does that change him uh, as a result of that and it's a really good like narrative reason for somebody to come to terms with their mortality with their life decisions with all of this yeah and I think narratively they're putting Arthur on the same page as the player because I think most people assumed that Arthur was going to die. Mm -hmm. He kind he kind of couldn't not like Red Dead One wouldn't really work with him being no. alive. Yeah. So it's it's giving the character the same information that the player already had, and it's how the character reacts to that information. Mm -hmm. Like, we knew he was going to die, but he, the character didn't know. But mm -hmm. now he does know. Yeah. So what's he going to do about that? And I think that's, that marks the point where the redemption starts to really start cementing. Yeah, 100%. Because he, he's got something to prove. And it kind of weirdly, it like unlocks him. There's a certain freedom he finds in it where like... He's kind of reached the conclusion, well, I'm going to die anyway. What do I, what can I do in this time I have left to make me feel like this had some point to it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, he kind of sees that through, he sees opportunity through the Wapiti reservation, through John, through Sadie, mm -hmm. through these, these little hints of hope he's got that he can try and turn it around, that he can try and make something right of the mess that these people he cares about are in. Which leads us into Act 6, which uh, it might be the best act. Really? I think, I think because it, it, it gets to a point where it's just payoff, 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 character moment, payoff. It's like crazy, uh, the way it trickles out towards the end there. You get the stuff with uh, 
the John prison escape and the whole hot air balloon thing. The hot air balloon mission is funny because like we haven't really talked about like mission variety, but the lots of missions will just have like a gimmick just in that one mission, like some sandbox thing they've built for, yeah. and they just use it in one mission. Like for example, the the pouring gasoline, setting fire to the the fields thing, or mm -hmm. the hot air balloon, or the milking. The milking. <laughs> that's the, that's that is the one. <laughs> um, oh yeah, and you, there's of course the whole uh, Edith Downs side quest where you can find the the wife of the fellow who gave yeah. And then give her Arthur TB, and she's like a prostitute in San yeah. Denis. The first time you find her, and you can find her son, her son working in the mines. In the mines. Um, as lots of really good dialogue and interesting dynamics that come from that, where he's like, I mean, we saw, we were just kind of joking about how much of a asshole he was to them mm -hmm. when he showed up and <laughs> ruined their lives, but from their perspective. Yeah. Um, well, he did. From yeah. anyone's oh, yeah, perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. He, he ruined their lives. And that's part of that, like, guilt he's carrying around, and, like, he, he doesn't think he's a good person. He never claims to be. But there's something powerful about that attempt. <laughs> You know? Yeah, and he he specifically asks not to be thanked, and then they thank him, and he's like, "No, yeah, don't, yeah," because it's like he he it's can't wrong. be thanked. Mm -hmm. Like he knows he's he's already like it's too late. It's, <laughs> he's done. He, yeah, he he already effed it in the air. Mm -hmm. You know, <laughs> he can't undo it, but like he can do something. Yeah. When the time comes, you gotta run and don't look back. This is over. I love the, the bridge mission with John. It's a quaint little mission where, again, Dutch's ridiculous plan at this point is to rile up the Wapiti tribe mm -hmm. um, and the, this tension that's been going on with them and the army and all this stuff with these, these vaccines that they're holding back from them and all this. But all Dutch sees that as is an opportunity to create havoc with the idea being let's create a distraction with this mess so yeah. they stop trying to come for us. Um, mm -hmm. Horrible idea, like all his other ideas yeah. <laughs> in all the previous acts. Um, Probably the most morally messed up. It's like, yeah, because there's something just so innocent about that reservation and they're just like so screwed over in like every aspect. It's like, it's just another one, another... Mm -hmm. Force coming in, taking advantage, using these people for their own gain. And it's like, yeah, it's sick. It's like a doing it with the Braithwaites and the Greys is one thing. But like taking it here, it's like so it's it's yeah, evil. using an oppressed <laughs> group for that. Yeah. To like to acknowledging those dynamics, them. knowing that's going on. After as well, um Dutch is is posturing on the boat before you kill Angelo Bronte, because Bill was in some conflict with Native Americans, and Bill refers to them as savages and stuff, and then... That's right, Dutch, he fought Dutch, in some war or something, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Dutch shuts Bill down, and he's like, Americans are just as savage, blah, 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 mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. That's right. And then he's the one trying to use their struggle for himself. Yeah, well, I fought, and I fought well. So you always tell us. You taught me something you could do with learning. <laughs> Them Indians were savages. Watch your mouth there, boy. Watch it. Only type of savage in these parts are moonshine, swilling, pompous, inbred locals. Dutch, I saw things out there. I don't doubt you saw things, Bill, but your tiny little mind was too small to comprehend what you saw. What you saw was people who lost everything to savagery, savagery of peasants. Failures come from Europe to reap some awful vengeance on God's last creation. Interesting way you boys got to prepare for a killing. This is where you kind of introduced to Rain's Fall, who I think is a really crucial character for Arthur. Rain's Fall mentions that he's a parent, he's lost kids before, parallel to Arthur. That's when Arthur reveals yes. this about his... He had a son. Um, he had a son and a baby mama. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that's optional too. Like, you can just miss that if you... Yeah. If you choose the other dialogue choice. And that's one thing I would criticize about the 
the presentation. I don't really understand the point of the choice, really, for, like, the honor mission stuff like that. Because it's presented as a way where it's like, oh, it's Mass Effect, where there's one way, like, there's the Renegade path and the Paragon path, mm -hmm. and both are content, where it's like, there's either the honor or nothing. Um, well, on my first playthrough, I interpreted it as, like, one choice will be one path, one will be another path, when it's actually, it's just a, a straight binary do you want to see this thing or not? Um, that just wasn't clear to me, I guess. Um, oh, do you not get to... Is the, is the... Like, if you say, I don't want to do this thing, you just don't see it. Oh, right, yeah. Yeah, 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 when... I thought perhaps it would be, like, a different mission, or go down a different way, or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's how I interpreted it the first time, so... I missed some, like, crucial stuff on that first playthrough. Just because right. of the confusing way I felt it was presented with those choices, the... Which don't feel that important to me. Yeah, on Rain's fall and the manipulation with his uh, his son Eagle flies, who Dutch really pinpoints and sees. Ah, that's my in. Mm -hmm. This this guy is young. He's got something to prove. He's fired up. He doesn't have the the wisdom of mm -hmm. Rain's fall. Like he's emotional because of what's going on. Like understandably so. But Dutch sees that as an opportunity. Um, and it's one of the most tragic things in the game to me. Everyone, stop! My son! My last son! Don't! Yeah, Dutch manipulating Eagle Flies to create this distraction, which builds up to, uh, this oil field attack. That's right! And it's this heartbreaking scene where Rain's Fall is begging his son. When I was your age, I fought. I saw death. I have killed. Maybe none of these men are good. Maybe a world in which they came to us is a world that we cannot endure. But endure we must. Father, you are tired. Do not die for pride, my son. My only boy. My precious boy. Do not mistake my strength for weakness. And it obviously does not work out. <laughs> it's another kind of big uh, Braithwaite Manor scale mission, that assault on the oil field. Yeah. The music ramping up, there's like the whole row of horses and all these characters. And yeah, this like, time you get to choose between riding with Dutch or riding with the Native that's Americans. Right. Yeah. Um, high on a option, obviously, being on, to ride with the Native yeah. Americans. Yeah. I think that's a really good, memorable mission. That's another one I'll watch sometimes, because it's like... Yeah, it's fantastic. The scale of this, the, like, set-piece nature of <coughs> it is like... Wow. Yeah. You're, you're building this. This is really impactful. You also get the O'Driscoll wrap-up, with the... Como O'Driscoll gets <laughs> hanged in public. You go and take out the sniper that was going to save him, so you just watch him. And then Sadie loses her cool and <laughs> yeah, starts, fight your way out. starts blasting. <laughs> yeah. And we're kind of getting towards the end of Act 6 here with the... Uh, there's one final train heist. Our best selves. Which leads up with John kind of getting injured. I think he's dead. There's a big moment at the end of the oil field attack where Dutch sees an opportunity to let Arthur die. And he takes it. Yeah. Um, and... Eagle flies, saves Arthur, but loses his life. At the cost of his life. Yeah. And Arthur's like, so why? Why'd you know? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so tragic. Which is directly Dutch's fault. Mm hmm? Yeah. He easily could have. So, yeah. Done something. There's like. What, what do you think is the point where Dutch becomes, like, irredeemable as far as that stuff's concerned? I feel like there is a point. He starts doing that snaky sort of stuff. Kind of early on from memory. But like the stuff with the tribe, that's that's so extreme. Even the Bronte murders pretty far. But like, it, but Bronte kind of had it coming. At least like he's kind of playing the same game in a yeah, way. Yeah, like Bronte's he's like definitely a, a scumbag. Yeah, yeah. He's done some scummy stuff. Um, Maybe it's killing the old lady. She's like a random old lady. <laughs> but I mean, it... <laughs> What are you gonna I, say? I almost just called Dutch Drake. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna, they got some parallels, I guess. Master manipulators. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
we don't see it, but he shoots an innocent woman in the face on a boat. True, you're in, right. That's probably the moment, yeah. Like, it, it's you're before right. the start of the game. Mm-hmm. Like, it, he's a lost cause. Yeah, you're completely right. And, uh, I mean, could Dutch redeem himself? Um, Maybe if he had, like, an Arthur-type life-threatening disease. Do you think he I probably would have just made him more crazy, though. To be yeah. Honest. It's, it's just not his way. It's not the way he's yeah. coded. The, 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 the camp is so depressing at this point. Yeah, so this is when you've moved to the cave, which is a scary mission when when you're getting the cave. Um, we're touching on the start of chapter six, I guess, at the end of chapter six, but you annihilate these cannibals and find a woman that they've kidnapped mm. and save her, which is another, like, just Arthur being a good guy yeah. thing. Um, but yeah, the, the whole camp environment... Gone are the days of those happy parties and, like, you want to be at the camp Mm -hmm. to hear... You want to avoid the camp at this point. Yeah. Some people have already cleared off. The people that are there are miserable. What's her face? Uh, Sean's... uh, Karen. Karen. She's, like, a mess by this point. Micah's, like, weird friends are there now. Yeah, they just turn up. They're just there. Um, And they'll say... there's There's a good conversation where one of them says something like kind of racist to Javier. Javier doesn't get that much screen time, but he's quite quite an interesting character because in he's charismatic. He's charismatic. He's, he's he's got a connection with John specifically. Sit down and have a drink with me, brother. <clears throat> no. I'll sit down and have several drinks with you. There, there are, there's dialogue where he talks about John in the camp where he says something like John would do the same for me type thing where he like sees him like on an equal playing field there's right. a, the whole like stand up moment at that point he's the only one not pointing the guns he's, yeah he's not aiming at anyone yeah yeah he's like aiming he's like himself. more impartial like he's like yeah not fully this... made his mind up or there's at least more grayness there yeah that there's... actually came from the actor he like fought for his character to do that it's so a good he... decision yeah, the way he played it throughout the game. You can tell, like, the... Just from the way he is behaving. And he's got this really positive attitude. He's got, like, like, a warmth to him? Yeah, and he... he, The character sounds like he's got love for everyone there. Mm-hmm. It's one thing where I think... It, it's one of the reasons I especially wanted a remake of mm. Red Dead 1. To, to redo Javier because like Javier in the context now with Red Dead 2 existing Javier's done dirty in Red Dead 1 he's more like he, cartoonish isn't he yeah he's like trying to run away when you find him in yeah. Red Dead 1 and he's like oh hey John rem- remember me <laughs> and, then, and then he pushes a box on John and it's like hey and then he runs away he's, he's like a a cheeky little villain you don't yeah. get the implied like friendliness, and and John implies like Javier ditched him. You know, John got shot and he was just left for dead, and yeah. Javier was one of the ones that just ditched him. That's one thing that doesn't perfectly mesh with this game being a prequel for me. The Javier thing. Not just it? Javier. The the whole thing where John's John's narrative throughout the whole of Red Dead One was like I was shot and left for dead by my old gang. The implication mm-hmm. being. The implication being that was when he stopped being in the gang. Not that he came right. back to the gang, had an interaction with everyone and a standoff. Because mm-hmm. it would make more sense in Red Dead 1 for him to have more of a thing specifically against Dutch, I guess. Right? Yeah. And maybe Bill, because Bill's just like a dumbass. It's like just yeah, Bill's just a, a dick. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> there's, there's fun content um, early on where... Bill's talking about, like, someday I'm going to run my own gang. I'm going to have my own gang. I'm going to be the top dog. Mm-hmm. And then he obviously There's does. There's some, like, illusions as well with him that you like, might be gay. Um, yeah. He's, like, quite obsessed with Kieran when he's around. And he says some quite weird things to Kieran. Really? Yeah, yeah. I'm just messing. So, uh, what are you... I mean, where are you... Uh, yeah. 
You wanna have a drink? Oh, no thank you, sir. So there's like a whole like maelstrom of shit that goes down in the camp around then, right? Mm -hmm. People just start falling like flies. I told them! I'm sorry? Yeah, I told them and I tell them again. Now I've got God's ear. You told who? What? Mr. Dutch's, Mil Dutch's girl claiming to be a rat. I just see it as a like, a way to try and get attention to try and, she's saying whatever will hurt him the most in that moment yeah. to try and get a rise it's, out of him. Yeah, it's like a fuck he... Mm -hmm. And she gets blasted for it. She gets blasted, uh, the like, matriarch character, I can't remember her name. Mm. She gets blasted. It, yeah, it winds up in like a tense, pointing their guns at each other. Who's with me and who's betraying me? And who is betraying me? Yeah. Dutch phrases it. Another like, he was very particular with his words, you know? Like, there's, there's no possible way it could be, there could be any universe where it's the right thing to do to oppose him. It ha it's a betrayal. Yeah. And it's always a betrayal. It's always a personal attack. It's not that he's made a mistake or that he's not a leader they want anymore. Uh -huh. It's that it's a betrayal. And that's, that's important to the way he interprets everything. Then it builds up into Red Dead Redemption, the mission. This whole like chunk of gameplay is like, <laughs> I think I mentioned it on the cast a few times. I like put off playing this, this mission for like a few yeah, weeks because yeah. you just know it's all going down. Not only are you going to lose Arthur, not only are you going to lose your fucking horse, but it's like, it's the end of all this, you know? Yeah. It's the end of the gang, it's the end of this family, and it didn't have to go down this way, but it's gone down in maybe the most like painful, brutal way possible, mm -hmm. really. But I didn't mention on the, the bridge mission with John where you're exploding it. I, I really love that Arthur and John get some like one-to-one -one time yeah. there. And he gets the, you better run and not look back line. Listen to me. When the time comes, you gotta run and don't look back. This is over. He really hammers home to him like, you, what matters is your family, Abigail and Jack. But what about loyalty? Be loyal to what matters. Yeah, be loyal Go. to what matters. Be loyal to what matters. Don't. Don't be trying to live in two worlds, just get out of this while you can. There are a few lines that are like really accentuated and stuck in my head because of like the marketing of this game, and that's one of them. Yeah. Better run and don't look back. Listen to me. When the time comes, you gotta run and don't look back. This is over. Yeah, I, I think it's worth noting as well, Arthur being whipped by Dutch is has has kind of a anti-John feeling. Well, because John was kind of an asshole at the start of the game. Like, he abandoned Abigail he, and Jack. Yeah, but it, it was all... I, I think Dutch was more upset that John ditched the gang. Yeah. It's not about the, like, fatherhood responsibility. Yeah. Or... So it, there's, there's that dynamic going on, which falls to the wayside when Arthur starts to realise the gang isn't really worth... If it's... If it's led by Dutch, I ain't worth shit. We are not criminals. We are outlaws. There's a difference? How do you even summarize this last mission? Because this is one thing I'll say is like the the choice stuff. I did a little bit in GTA 5 as well, right? I just don't really, I don't really get it. I don't consider yeah. the like evil choices. I guess I'm glad you can do it, but I don't consider that to be like a canon ending, <laughs> really. Like it, it, it undercuts the redemptive part with the brutal way Micah can like just like stab you to death it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's like too much and if that was the canon ending I feel like everyone would hate that it's like a level of darkness a level of brutality that's like sure it's what Micah would do but there's something like narratively unsatisfying about that the Arthur getting a win even though he dies like, in his dying breaths, he's saying, like, In the end, uh, uh, I won! Yeah. <laughs> you know, and getting to see, like, the sunrise and the deer and, like, that. That's the end of the character, to me. Yeah. I, I think the idea is that you're choosing whether to redeem him or not. Yeah. So, to, to lean into that and to let you not redeem him... To have the option is, is cool. Yeah. yeah. Because I, I've, I've never even seen like the full scene play out where he just gets brutally like it, yeah i've seen it i've done it um that was your first my first playthrough yeah. that happened to me yeah yeah i feel like that would totally change <laughs> the way you see the game but seeing them all now i'm like 
I'm not doing that again. <laughs> well, yeah. By this point, you've built up such, like, a hatred for Micah. And it seems, especially on that first playthrough, you are kind of putting more blame on Micah than Dutch. At least I was. Yeah. Where you're like, none of this would happen without, without Micah. And I guess now's a good time to actually delve into what I was saying earlier, where, like, I think Micah is one of the... <sighs> misunderstood isn't even the word, it's... He is totally upfront. He doesn't hide anything. You're just afraid of opening your mind because you might not like what you find. You're probably right. Dutch will see through both of you. I'll make sure of that. It all makes sense now. No, it damn well doesn't. I did not take you for a man of mindless compassion, Mr. Bell. No, oh, I ain't. But I have the good grace to shoot a fella full in the face, not call myself his friend and shoot him in the back. Is that so? Usually. Not always. Sometimes there's nothing better than shooting a fella who thinks you like him in the back. Yeah, he doesn't try to abstract that at all. So like putting all the blame on him is like, who really invited this in? Everything he says, the way he conducts himself, he's like, all there is is living and dying. All there is is survival. Uh -huh. And he says it again and again and again. So there's there's nothing like surprising or even like a betrayal there. Cause it's like, he is, he's one of the most consistent characters actually. <laughs> like as far as if, that. If not the most. The yeah. most, yeah. He's so well written. People hate this character so deeply that, like, go on YouTube and watch the the cast interview when he's like coming on stage and whatnot. People like they like boo. <laughs> they're, they're actually like mean to the actor because he did yeah. such a good job selling this character. I, I don't put the blame on him. I really no, don't. I, I don't put the. I mean, he he definitely made stuff worse. Yeah. You can blame him for a lot of bad stuff. That's what I guess what I'm trying to say, he wasn't hiding it. But who invited that in? Out of some weird, misjudged loyalty. Micah saved Dutch's life. And in return, he integrates him into the gang. Everyone rejects him. Everyone knows there's something up with this guy. Mm -hmm. But Dutch, for some reason, allowed him to stay. Allowed this poisonous rat to linger. Endanger everybody. The buck stops with Dutch, in my mind. Yeah. I think you can damn the two of them, though. Yeah. Because Mike is a, a scumbag. Mm. And he, he did rat. He did which, rat. Which, like... He did rat, and he needed to exist as a character to be... Just narratively, there needed to be some kind of... Foil. Foil, some kind of moment to, like, cap the game on. Because you couldn't obviously kill Dutch. Yeah, um, yeah. You needed some satisfaction. I don't think you'd even, like, want to kill Dutch. By yeah. the end of the story, like, you don't, like, hate Dutch. He's so misguided and he doesn't... It's more like, pathetic. Yeah. You f you, He's you like look down on him. Yeah. Like, uh, whereas with Micah, it's with how upfront he is about being a shit face. It's like, yeah, yeah I want to, like, that mm -hmm. I... Bang bang yeah. bang bang bang. He's a. I guess what I'm saying is he's, he's a static character in the best of ways. Whereas Dutch is the opposite of that. Yeah. No one's like invested in Micah. Everyone hates Micah from the word go. I remember saying to you when first playing through the game, like, I kind of like this character. Not in the, I'd like him as a person, but like I I like his presence. He's oh, he, he's, he's the really... only one that brings like conflict and yeah yeah he really like accentuates that that tension within the the group um, yeah and it it really feeds into arthur's like sense of betrayal with dutch i gave you all i had mm -hmm. and he's like i've been here this whole time i've stood by you and you let this rat come in and just you enabled this yeah so it's, it's dutch's fault but Micah is still, like, a big problem. Because Micah was also giving Dutch loads of bad ideas. 
Mm -hmm. And it's Dutch's fault for listening to those ideas and choosing his ideas over Arthur's and Hosea's. And I guess, yeah, in, in the like group dynamic in this familial like hierarchy with Dutch is at the top. Dutch is the one with the power. Mm. Micah doesn't dictate who's in the gang, who's not. Yeah, yeah. Dutch allowed that to manifest. But I think uh, Micah has manipulative qualities as well. Mm. He navigated his way to being in that position close to Dutch, where Dutch trusted him. And the way he talks to Dutch is totally different to the way he talks to everyone He's a bootlicker. Yeah. Yeah, and, and... What's his game, though? Like, what does he want? It's, it's like a power dynamic thing. Like, Dutch, Dutch has the power, and he's got an ego that he loves being stroked. He wants to so, be where Arthur used to be. And he kind of figures out how to yeah. replace that spot in the hierarchy. Yeah, so yeah. He, he just starts sucking up to Dutch. Mm-hmm. And Dutch loves his ego being stroked, especially when he get, people keep criticizing him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Micah isn't doing that. So he, he is a scum fuck for doing that yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's like psychopathically navigating a social The guy is a sociopath. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's like insane. <laughs> and, and Dutch is like an egomaniac who can't see like past himself. So as long as someone is giving mm. him like a, an ego boost then they're number one to him yeah you know i i just think micah is an, a really great character um, mm -hmm. love that performance love that dialogue i do love how consistent he is over here in his rants at the the camps and stuff and how he just makes everyone uncomfortable mm -hmm. i didn't know if um they went too far with it's too evil too evil it's specifically one line and i'm skipping right to the end of the epilogue but mm. in the standoff with micah when you're john micah keeps saying join us john mm -hmm. join us <laughs> and it's like is this like darth vader shit like i i like that because um he starts doing that when he suddenly has the upper hand of having Sadie and he thinks he's won, kind of. And Dutch has come out. Yeah, so yeah, so he assumes you. it's done. Dutch has come out, like, we've got this. Um, yeah. He's not expecting Dutch to betray him in that moment. Mm -hmm. Join us, John. Join us. You love to hate him. Yeah. I love to hate him. Yeah. Now, I just think that performance brings out certain, like, complexities from him, even with that, like, static nature of him. I just love how all these different characters have these, like, deep philosophies that they live by, and the way they, like, communicate it, and the way you learn it is very, like, naturalistic, and just, yeah, just flows real good. It just yeah, yeah, yeah. feels like all these different, like, perspectives and types of people are represented within this group, so you just have constantly interesting dynamics at play. You know? What else is there to say about that final mission? Uh, putting the hat on John. Um, mm. That whole decision, your horse going down. That choice of if you're going to go back for the money or help John escape. Again, I feel like the, the canon choice would be to help John escape. That makes sense. Yeah, it doesn't really make sense in that mo moment to go back for the money. Like, who's the money for? Yeah. Is Arthur thinking, like... Even if it's the dishonorable thing to do, is Arthur thinking, go back for the money for John and Abigail? Mm. Is that the thought process? Or is it... Because it John, it John knows... Or, yeah. Arthur knows he's going to die. Yeah. So he's not doing it for like greed for himself. Mm -hmm. So I don't really know what it means to go back for yeah. the money. Yeah. Again, it just kind of seems like... We built this option, so there's an option. You can if you want to. I wouldn't recommend it, but you can. Yeah. Um. <laughs> um, or redeem yourself. Like, the, um, it's pretty plain. With the whole Arthur sickness, while we're on that, um, got to shout out... I, d I don't know how they did the coughing thing. Um, like, if that was Roger Clark, like, doing something, or if they, like, had certain coughs that they, like, edited in but it's like 
I've got the same question to ask for Arkham City and Mark mm. Hamill when yeah. the Joker's ill. Like, how how do they do that? Especially especially in Arkham City. That, like, this isn't an Arkham City. <laughs> yeah, video, yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't he, thought about that. He, like, while, yeah. worked it into his... You're right, into his the talking. But how, yeah. do, how do actors do that? Do they, like, gargle milk and then do it? Because milk, maybe. like, lines your You're right, yeah. Maybe there shit. is some trick like that. They um, will, like, eat a bunch of cake and then you've got, like, yeah. a cakey gun. But, like, the way sometimes after missions, like, he just sits on a rock and, like, you can't move the character for a while and he's just like... <laughs> Mm. It's like it's, it's really painful to watch. Um, yeah, like his face is like he's drained of color. Mm. Got these dark rings around his eyes. He's like coughing up blood. Your health bar goes down quicker. Food like doesn't help you as much. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's really cool. That it's stuff. mechanically that diegetic... depressing. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, and it sells like the gravity of like this is. This is the end. <laughs> yeah, <For> you did. <laughs> I remember seeing a article a few. It must have been like six months after the game came out. That was like someone who has a terminal illness, writing an article on how well Red Dead Two really? represents through gameplay mechanics mm -hmm. being ill like that. Um, yeah, yeah. It's it's like a really creative way of. Uh, wrapping up that character in a nice little bow um yeah and it makes you feel it in the gameplay in the moment like this change i like i don't i don't want it but there's nothing i can do about mm -hmm. it it's, you know, like your stamina goes down faster mm -hmm. yeah 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 it's genius. very clever stuff and it doesn't go too far to the point of like being quite annoying yeah it's, if, it's if you have all the upgrades, if you have all the like satchel upgrades and stuff, if you have all of those, then the the debuffs from the illness level it out to like normal mm. percentages. If you want to try and counteract it, I guess. <laughs> Min max. Yeah. Um. So then, the wheel plays, and you transition over from Arthur as he says goodbye. To John, and every time the same, I go through the same like motions of like, man, god damn it, because <laughs> so, the wheel, that song, that piece of music in that transition where it goes to John and Abigail and Jack in the, the carriage or whatever, <laughs> that piece of music was used in one of the those initial trailers I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so there's already something punchy about that. I feel like they use that song for a reason. It's got like a certain I don't know, when I listen to that song now, it's got it carries a lot of like emotional weight. Yeah, it's quite a moving track. Mm-hmm. For sure. But then there's also something like it's a combination of like misery and hope, because like they got out. But then you know it's kind of what's so brilliant about the epilogue. Even though there is like hope and life there. It is all undercut, knowing what happens in Red Dead 1. Yeah. And it adds this, like, tragedy to, you know, you're building the house that he fucking dies in. You're... Yeah. I, I'm i kind of jumping around, but the... So, saying that, though, when you're building that house, it's a bomb. <laughs> like, that's a good-ass time. <laughs> so, yeah, there are a few things where, after that, it's, it's such, like, an exhausting emotional payoff, that mission Red Dead Redemption takes a little second to like rebuild or like find its footing again yeah because it almost is like a hard reset because you know you're a new character you gotta like re-level up you don't really have your stuff you gotta upgrade your cores and stuff again mm. you don't have the freedom you did in like act three or whatever you're like stuck on yeah. this farm you're like scrappy trying to get by he loses abigail for a big section and jack he's mm. got to prove himself but the same thing happens every time where you get to the uh, it's American Venom or something. Well, yeah. No, Jim Milton rides again. Oh, right. Where, like, he's, it's just John's like curse where he's like always pulled back in to this life. The farm gets attacked. He's got to go and sort shit out and you get that fan service moment, which is so needed at that point. You need an upper after everything that's happened, after the misery. And just to get that Red Dead 1 music kick in you get to kill trevor from red the, uh gta <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the reference to the cover from the first game with the sword off 
It's such an awesome moment. It's just like, oh yeah, John. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. I love John too. John, John still rocks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the things I love about the epilogue is going back to the humor that's like baked into Red Dead One, especially when Uncle comes back. That dynamic between Uncle and John is it's so funny to me. Yeah, I like, think genuinely it's, hilarious. It's it it is better than Arthur's dynamic with Uncle. Yeah. It it just fits. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's something about it because it's like a little reminder of John's past. He like can't get rid of this past. Uh, Uncle, he's just like a weird character because he, he like he's so lazy. He doesn't <laughs> really. Yeah, he's he's way more goofy and like in the first game, he's actually. I don't really he... remember him that well in the first game. <laughs> he... I understand more why John is just horrible to him in the first game because <laughs> like uh, Uncle's just an asshole. In the first one, he's an old grumpy mm. dick, and in two, he's he's kind of funny about it. His his inflections and stuff. He's like, yeah, yeah. And there are moments where you feel for him when he's captured by the Skinners. Yeah, yeah, like and burned alive. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Uncle's I, bad day. <laughs> I, yeah, I kind of feel sorry for him. It, that whole mission is really strange. Like Uncle's bad day. Yeah. I don't know what purpose it, like, story-wise. I think they, I guess they were trying to come up with, like, combat scenarios for that section of the game to keep it vibrant. And they have the whole yeah. Skinner stuff nearby in, like, tall trees, um, which is really close to um, John's, John's ranch. house. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, I think uh, Uncle exists for pure um, comic relief much more so probably really needed especially oh, in his later needed. parts of the mm -hmm. game um and even when he's like being held over a campfire getting melted mm -hmm. it's not really that serious like the next day he's pretty much fine <laughs> and also yeah you know he's in the first game so yeah yeah so you, you, you don't need to stress but yeah, yeah it's pretty brutal you get these little sprinklings of hope like um when you go find Charles, who's doing these like street fights yeah. for cash, um, Sadie reaches out, mm -hmm. um, which is on, like the last thing they kind of got to wrap up, obviously with like Micah, because Sadie's whole thing is like, if I could find him, I'll let you know, and we can go take him out. Yeah, she's a character who's set up to really enjoy a bit of revenge. Mm -hmm. She's like a fully fledged bounty hunter at this time. She's like a badass, yeah, doing her own thing. Um, and eventually, yeah, you do get the call. They know where Micah is. They hear one of the boys who was at the camp gate crashing. Um, yeah. There's another kind of like brutal moment where you go track him down, interrogate him in Strawberry. Yeah, this time you're the one like dragging the person. Mm -hmm. You drag him up the stairs and... You can choose to hang him or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and either way, he gets hung. Yeah. So just hang him. Yeah. There's a cool conflict there with Abigail, just like saying, just don't, please just stop. Yeah. Just don't, don't do this. Why would you risk throwing this away now? Like right after getting the ranch, like you just got me and Jack back. Why are you doing this? And she was right. I ain't got no other choice. Keep an eye on the place for me. Of course. Please. <laughs> you shouldn't have gone, mm -hmm. I don't think. Um, really. Yeah, the the implication story wise is that John The implication is that got, seeking revenge is what winds up being his downfall, right? Yeah, he they find Micah's corpse up at the mountains or something. Yeah, yeah, they show in the credits uh the the guy from the first game is there in like the wreckage of uh that camp that yeah, John and Edgar Ross attack. Um so I guess they follow the clues that leads them to John. Yeah. I don't know if that was necessary. Because, like, John specifically uses his real name when buying the house and stuff. Mm. You, well, you think they would have found him anyway? I mean, realistically. Mm -hmm. I think what they're trying to say is that there is a direct... Correlation that's what them. I interpret from it. Uh, yeah, I think like, that's it, it's what they're saying But if you base it in any sort of reality, it doesn't really pass too well 
Mm. But for the purposes of telling that narrative and giving you the high drama climax of getting your revenge on the top of a mountain by like a yeah. cabin, it, like mm -hmm. it's it's worth it for that. Yeah. So it, it's like the game needed that, like to end on, like that that bullet point, that full stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for Dutch to turn up in that moment mm. is is this partly Dutch's redemption? Um, Dutch's Red Dead Redemption too. <laughs> I don't know, because I, I think we kind of established earlier he's too far gone at this point. He has that line where he's like, I don't got much to say no more. Yeah, I think that's part of his redemption. Say something, Dutch! Say something! I ain't got too much to say no more. At least the self-awareness of knowing that, like... Yeah, I, this I've is stopped, like, bullshitting my way through stuff, and it's, it's, it's not so much about him maybe mm -hmm. I'm I love that with uh when Arthur's dying too where it's like the one time he's speechless yeah he's got nothing to add it he actually, just walks away in silence yeah it... ah. Ah. come on it fits in his head then like oh I've fucked everything yeah yeah mm -hmm. it's like uh, one of the only times you see him kind of take responsibility for yeah it's through Arthur's redemption, Dutch also kind of gets redeemed. I like that. Mm. I think yeah. that's very clever. And on that note, didn't mention it earlier, but there's that really cool scene with Arthur and Dutch where they're being chased by the army and Dutch says something about gravity and how you can't fight it. I tried to fight change. It's a waste. I see that now. It's waste. You can't fight nature, Captain. You can't fight change. You can't fight gravity. Uh -huh. Which is a reference to the first game. Yeah. Which is what he says to John um, before he throws himself off a cliff. Yeah. But also reinforces the themes of like, you, ca you can't fight against the industrialization, the change. change. Of, yeah, exactly. Um, and the last thing I'll shout out from the epilogue is the mission, the really sweet little mission you go on as John oh, with yeah. Abigail, where you propose on the boat and see like a movie. And uh, it's a nice uh, ode to the earlier scene with Arthur and uh, Mary Linton, where mm. you go see a show, but all that stuff does not work out. But it does work out here. It doesn't work out with Arthur because he is to rough someone up or something? Well, his whole thing is that uh, Mary Linton's family didn't like the fact he was a gunslinger, so like never really was able to work yeah, with yeah. them. And that like tragedy of like probably could have left the gang and made that work real realistically. Yeah, um, there were many opportunities where he could have done that, but his unquestioning loyalty, misplaced loyalty, undercut that and made it so he missed out on that. Yeah, but I, d I do really love all of his interactions with her. He's got this really gentle, like, timid um, mm -hmm. way about. And you can, like, try to put your arm around her. And, uh... Yeah, it's, it's, like, so cute mm -hmm. from Arthur. You just see so much range from him as, like, a character. You yeah. see him, like, just deal with so many situations. It makes him, like, really relatable. Yeah, but there's also a, a scene that um, really sticks out to me in one of these missions, one in Saint-Denis where he's he's waiting for Mary Linton. It's something to do with the mission where you're like going to talk to her dad or something. Um, but you're waiting for her and there's this guy sweeping and Arthur's like, leave. And then the guy has a bit of back chat and then Arthur like threatens him and mm. he's like, I'll fucking kill you. I'll get, stop fucking sweeping, I'll kill you. Mm. <laughs> and the guy's like, shit, jeez, okay, I'm, I'm gone. Yeah. And he leaves. Um, and I, I don't know if that's Arthur, like, compensating for the fact that he's being, like, like, kind of cutesy with, with mm. Mary Linton and he's, like, I am tough. I just made that, yeah, that sweeping guy <laughs> cry and run away. Well, bro, that's, that's the plot of this game, for the most part. And that's, 
that's kind of honestly scratching the surface to be honest <laughs> yeah i mean like um that's not, without even mentioning like the majority of the side quests um just like stuff that's communicated through the the map design and the environmental storytelling all this like leftover civil war stuff this uh I've, i absolutely love that side quest with the um the ex-slave owner who's all like butthurt yeah um uh, excellent excellent stuff arthur says at the end of that mission some jobs aren't for saving and some legacies throw his book on the fire arthur pissing on lovely way yeah. to wrap that up it's so really happy. satisfying and then i normally kill him yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like throw dynamite on him or something um yeah you get you gain honor for doing that yeah true yeah bro so i feel like we covered arthur we covered john jack and abigail dutch micah really adore the character of, of hosea but i feel like we talked about him a fair amount charles is really cool as well um yeah, he's like an angel on too. Arthur's shoulder, kind of. Yeah. He gets like cool mission with the buffaloes. Um, he he keeps like the most level head throughout. He's kind the of like the story. inverse of Micah. Yeah. Um if Micah's the devil, he's like the angel. Yeah, he was introduced to the gang within like the same time period. He's only yeah. been with them for like six months at the start mm -hmm. of the game, I think. Yeah. Strauss, Sean, Josiah. Trelawney, he's got a weird character. Um, yeah, it's like wanderer. He's like half part of the gang. He just appears sometimes, helps out, and then vanishes. Yeah, he's, he's cool. I like that. Arthur gets say goodbye to him in the last act. Swanson, uh, also has a. He's got a cool little mini great. arc that, if you're paying attention, you can see where like because you can find his like heroin needle in in the Bible in he the carries Bible. around. Yeah, um, but he manages to kick it. Um, a few of the characters actually get cute little endings. Um, Pearson, you can like find. He's like running a shop. In Rhodes, I think. In Rhodes. Uh, just just a couple of days ago when I was like just doing some misc stuff as John in the prologue. <laughs> in the prologue. I just went to a random train station and was walking like by a, a bench. And Rain's Fool was sat there and just started talking. And it started a cutscene. And it was a full cutscene with John and Rain's Fall. And it was like, it like brought a tear to my eye. I was like, what the fuck? Where, I've really? never seen this. Where did this come from? And oh it's like God. this beautiful little like moment where it like caps off the Rain's Fall character. I've never seen this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, I wasn't looking for it. <laughs> my name is Rain's Fall. And I'm Jim Milton. John Marston. Oh. Me. Is Arthur? Uh... He passed away. Long time ago. Oh, I'm sorry. He saved my life. He gave his. That doesn't surprise me one bit. <laughs> and you? I know you had tough times. Ah, uh, well... My people aren't really a tribe. We're just a bunch of families, I suppose. But we're in Canada now. It's, uh... What are you doing here? I don't really know. My son, I suppose. Oh, you fell. I, I know. I'm sorry. I've got a son. I'm very sorry. Oh, it was a long time ago now. There are a few times, um, if you're exploring as John, you can just like stumble across like old gang members and just have a little moment with them, mm. which is really cool and like diegetic and clever. Because that scene ends with like Rain's full of like a smile on his face and... It's good to see you, Mr. Marston. <laughs> and you. Uh, it's a really cool scene. I'd I never knew about yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. I just found it by complete accident. And that's kind of like part of the joy of this game, really. Like, it just... Yeah, it's just the gift that keeps on giving. Keeps on giving. Keeps on giving. Um, yeah, so that's what. Like, there are 110 missions total, and that's like... We picked uh, just like the standout ones, I guess. There's yeah. like still so much shit. I don't know what you want to do about this, bro. Because we didn't even talk about like... The game part. The actual game. <laughs> um, <laughs> it might be worth leaving this as just story, to be honest. Yeah. Look, we're like approaching I mean, three hour mark. Mm -hmm. 
nearly triple the length of our original review. I'm just covering to... like twelve percent of what we did <laughs> in the original. One. Is there anything else that's like jumping out at you that would make sense to include in in this? Because I'd be I'd be down at a later date to maybe do a the stuff we didn't cover as far as like yeah the game part yeah the game the mechanics the like the systems um, that kind of stuff like the map design um, that kind of stuff yeah I'd I'd happily do that. Because it would feel like, I don't know. Uh, yeah, if that feels right, to be honest. Yeah, yeah. It's more of a story retrospective. And that's, yeah, really what I've connected with is that story, I think. Mm -hmm. The... It's just something so... Even though it's such an unrelatable setting as far as, like, the Old West. Yeah, There's something very true about it, like these character dynamics, what it's saying about people... Um, you've met Dutch in real life. You've met mm. a Jose. You've met a Bill. You know, like there's yeah, something true about these people. You've met a Micah even, and you felt existential at some point as well. Mm -hmm. You've uh, everyone's thought about that yeah. thing that is always on Arthur's mind past chapter five. And I guess shout out like last thing. The moments of like music, Unshaken, mm. That's the Way It Is, Crash of Worlds, the house building theme. Especially the house the, building. The, theme. the soundtrack is just incredible. All of it, yeah. All the Woody Jackson stuff, all of these like guest celebrities, mm. D'Angelo, like just showing yeah. up. Um, <laughs> it's such coming like, out of retirement. Yeah. It's just such a collaboration of like love and dedication. Um, Genius minds. The only thing, or if if we're wrapping up, there is one last thing I'd like to say directly to Rockstar mm. is um fix the fucking PC port. Mm. You shit. Yeah, it's good you mentioned Fuckers. that. We've, we've both had issues with the PC port where there's apparently a bug on the PC version where the game can break if you go into the settings menu, and that's mm. what breaks it. <laughs> we've both yeah. had that happen. I had it. I had it. I've got a pretty good PC. I couldn't get it to run more than one, literally one frame per second. Yeah, I that's what for, mine is doing now. Yeah, yeah. I showed you. We've had it. We've mm -hmm. both got completely different rigs. It's happened to both of us. Yeah. Mine was fine. Then now I've... It's like we swap. I've upgraded my CPU, and it seems to be since then... Uh-huh. Won't work. Um, and also, considering that this game came out half a decade ago... I still think it's probably the best looking game ever made. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. On PC it looks just insane. That lighting, you know, you get the like the light like casting through skin yeah, on I've, their ears and their I've nose. Got a, and I've got a photo somewhere on my phone that I took. It there's like a in a cutscene, a strike of lightning behind Arthur. So it's been raining. His skin's wet. The light is like refracting through his mm -hmm. beard, and it's like, wh huh? It looks it's crazy. It looks better than reality. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the mocap, the like character models. It's just next level. Um, yeah. 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 So, bro, is Red Dead Redemption Two as good as they say? This many years later. The story is... Damn straight. Damn oh, straight. I'm right there with you. The oh. story is better. Hmm? There's so much to, like, delve through in, like, these Red Dead lore channels I'd recommend. Yeah, like I'd, I'd so recommend... Much. I'd highly recommend the ones that go through the historical accuracies mm. of each chapter. I can't remember the name of the YouTuber, but his videos are great. And don't try looking for the legendary catfish. Believe me, I tried. <sighs> On that note, bro, I think we're done for this. Fucking hell. Thanks for watching. Um, top of the morning. Top of the morning, uh, you were... Uh, Look out for yourselves out there. How about that? Look out for yourselves out there. How about that? <laughs>